Welcome to And That's Why We Drink, where I think I accidentally bummed Christine out a little too Sorry, hard. I literally am crying. I need to stop <laughs> and get it together. I think that was the first I've ever seen Christine cry as if on cue. It was wild. You just immediately went I into just, the my waterworks. Tears started flowing down <laughs> my face. <laughs> Do I just feel so bad, Em. It's okay. Well, they don't know what's going on because it's been a week. But it just like ruined Em's entire family vacation. Uh I had I had plans to like, go to Iceland with Allison's family, but this uh what'd you call it? What's it called? Foot hand, foot, and mouth disease. Apparently I'm reacting a little wildly to it, and I have about last I counted, like nearly 60 blisters all over my body. Yeah, it's like a plague. It's pretty bad. And uh I can't even walk. And the whole point of this Iceland trip was to probably be outdoors and, and hike, which I already God forbid, but now really I can't actually do it more than usual um so we haven't decided i mean we still have 24 hours for me to decide but it, it's not looking good and also we, we are worried about like spreading it to maybe allison's family not getting it so uh christine feels a little guilty but there's i'm I not I, it's <laughs> christine it's not it's it fine it's, so bad. <laughs> it's fine i i'm not i'm not trying to make christine feel better i'm just you're not, but... I, I was just updating but um but i think it you know christine's feeling a little sad today it's that was not it was not meant to make you feel sad christine it's okay i just, I just we... know this has been planned for a long time and now i don't it's know okay I just feel bad. it's okay you didn't know we didn't know i didn't even know that i hadn't had it before it's just no, now now should have gone to a hand foot and mouth party when you were I a should, kid i sh <laughs> i know i should have gone and then it should have you know we should have all just hugged really tight to make yeah, sure that we all really just got high it. five each yeah, other yeah yeah oh no um it's a it's a weird it's it's i'm not, i'm usually not someone that gets like skin things so i think i'm my body's just also like weirdly sensitive to it but mm -hmm. anyway that's that's the update and poor christine it's is really somehow going through it more than I am right now. So. I just feel so bad. I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to text Allison later. No, it. Well, you. No, you don't have to. But I know you're going to because you're you. But you don't have to. I literally um, have tears like streaming. What is wrong with me? <laughs> I appreciate the empathy, but it's. I'm not like. I'm not. I wasn't trying to like put you on blast or anything. That's I not. I know. I know. It just. It just anyway. happens. And I already told Christine my baby's gonna kick your ass one day, and karma will fully, you know, blend out. But until I mean, then, your baby's. If your winning. baby is a flea on a rat that gives me bubonic <laughs> plague, then like I'll understand. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, I I'll understand. Just take, I'll take it. Okay. Well, thank God because my I was already worried about the type of baby I'd have, and I guess a flea on You're a rat for the plague. A flea on a rat. <laughs> like Stuart little or something like at least we can't get worse than that um oh, no. even if my little baby one day is a flea on a rat during the plague it, <laughs> my baby had a purpose on this earth so <laughs> to kill me yes <laughs> to, thank to you to eliminate to eliminate <laughs> christine uh anyway i guess i was gonna ask why you drink but i think i gave you one by accident so yeah what the hell the last two episodes i've been like prepared with a good reason and then i'm like now i'm crying for a totally different reason what was your good reason what was your actual reason my actual reason was that i got a lasik eye surgery but that just feels now like i'm bragging about my good fortune and good experiences well you're putting good work to them with the tears and everything you yeah know, apparently so. that's true maybe they've re reconstructed my tear glands or something let's talk about christine getting lasik because if you were at our cleveland show columbus columbus show um i found out on stage with everybody else Oops. that christine got lasik that morning and didn't tell me <laughs> Oops. and i found that was uh, during our show we do a drinking game and christine found a way to write it into the script without telling me that she was going to do this she went oh by the way and it's it's a scripted show i i know what's not supposed to be said and <laughs> when i heard oh by the way guess what i went oh god we're oh going no off script what <laughs> happened and um that was when christine let me know that lasers had been in her fucking eyes and then she came to work oh god it 
it was not my it was not it was a very not a smart idea like i recommend if you're considering was it not? lasik eye surgery do it don't do it like a few hours before you have to drive to another city to perform on a stage did you That's, actually not feel very good? Because you pulled it off really well. Like no, you, I, fe- I actually, like, I felt totally fine. It just was one of those things where, like, I had to just kind of finagle my way into this because they were they were like, well, you know, take a couple, take a day or a couple off work. And I was like, well, what if I have something, like, the next day? And they were like, well, that should be okay. And then I was like, well, that's close enough to a few hours. <laughs> so you, you, so by finagle, you mean you had to lie to every person just that would, pe- just anyone couple. that was going to be an obstacle on that's your right. own plan you've already written for yourself. Right. So I don't see what the problem is. And so I did it anyway. And then you're Blaise just a was, human bulldozer. It's amazing. That's right. Thank you. Finally, somebody gives me the recognition <laughs> I deserve. Um, no, I, they did, they did know. I did tell the doctor I had a uh, show that night and he was like, that's fine just don't wear eye makeup so i was like well that's not gonna stand no i'm just kidding um but so i i I was like oh i went in on saturday and they were like here uh, first of all i'll explain why real quick i had a reason i'm not saying it's a good reason but i had a reason to do it the day of our show and that's because they were having a thousand dollar off sale until the end of march and it was the end of March. And I was like, well, it shit. really was like the last day or something. Yeah, it was like it? the 20th, the 30th, I think. And I thought, well, tomorrow I'll be in Cleveland. So got to do it today. Um, and so I asked for their earliest appointment, which was 750 a.m. And I went in and it took literally three to five minutes. And then I went home. You said and- seven to eight seconds per yeah, eye. Yeah, yeah, seven to eight seconds per eye. Exactly. That's and beyond. They count. So I'm like, okay, this one took six. This one took eight, whatever. And then, um, like, three minutes later, my mom drove me home, and I put in eye drops and went to sleep for four hours. Blaze drove me to Columbus, and we did our show. And now I can see because these are just blue light glasses. I've tricked you all. I actually forgot that you had LASIK and were still wearing glasses because I would have been like, you're so stupid. You're- <laughs> no, <laughs> it's very exciting because I feel like I always had to wear contacts to put the blue light glasses on. I understand. So now I'm completely. like, I can just when I lay in bed at night and look at my computer, I could just put these on. There's it's nothing. Just there's wonderful. nothing worse too than the. Uh, I know they've got those websites where like you can like trade out the fr- like they're like oh, magnetic, yeah. but like there's really nothing worse than having to have like a collection of glasses. It's to br- and then and you bring them with you. They're upstairs. They're in my bag. Exactly. Like, like I never exactly. wear sunglasses because it would require me to bring sunglasses because I can't just. And you have a prescription. You need to trade them out. It's such a pain mm-hmm. in the butt. And that's the other one. Now sunglasses. I don't have to wear contacts to wear sunglasses. I just put them on my face. It's unbelievable. Like to wake up for the first few days, I thought I accidentally slept in my contacts, which is a scary feeling. And also my eyes were kind of dry from the procedure. So I was like, oh, shit. And then I was like, wait, no, I can just sit up and look out the window and like see leaves and trees. It's amazing. It's amazing. So if you're considering it, highly recommend. I am so thrilled. It was cheaper than I expected. It was also $1,000 off. So, you know, look for sales. Uh, it was so easy. It didn't hurt one bit. Um, I don't know. I just, I like, I highly recommend it. Um, I'm not saying, I, I'm not saying go to work a few hours later. Cause like, if, if you have the option, like fucking take a couple days off hello of course i'm gonna recommend that but if you're a gemini bulldozer like christine you could probably figure it out um is there what color was the laser um it was these red blinking light well no it's a blue light blue circle that you stare at and then there are a couple like red blinks you don't feel anything don't even always... feel like something's on your eye you just kind of look at a pulsing light and they're like and they were so kind and they were like you are doing such a good job. Like you're, you're nailing it, Christine. Good job. And I'm like, I'm just laying here, but thank you for all of your motivation. Um, and then they <laughs> count like, down. They're like two more, more seconds, one more second. Like they're just so like gentle and kind. Um, and it took, I mean, at literal seconds on each eye and now I can wake up and see. Technology's like, fucking what? crazy. And my mom did this 18 years ago. And with the her- knife with the with the knife one with the blade so most a lot of places do just lasers now and they kept saying a word that i'm not going to say because it's one of m's least Mm -hmm. favorite words i've already injured m enough today so i'm going to (laughs) not 
Um, but it starts with an F, and it's and four letters, but it's worse than fuck. So I'm it's, not... It starts with an F and then ends with an L-A-P. Oof! They said it so many times. Oofa doofa. I was like, I can't hear this word anymore, please. And guess um, and guess, guess what that flap of yours was. It was moist. <laughs> not anymore. It wasn't for a few days, but all these eye drops and now me crying all over myself. It's really moist their back. flaps. Like, just explain it to me. Wait a second. You have said on the show how that's your least favorite combination and, and so many people say when will you ever use the phrase when would moist you use flaps it? well right fucking now a medical professional uses it so shut up that's I did when it for you thank you um well i'm impressed and um i bow down to you because i don't plan on ever doing that i don't think i could so I know I think you, you say could. i know you could because it like really was so easy and they they can suggest you take like a xanax beforehand or whatever and they also helps you nap and they gave me two tylenol pm at 7 30 in the morning which i was like this is a weird feeling well one i never need help to nap let's be clear <laughs> okay fair <laughs> two i think i just I, the only thing that's in my head is the fact that flap there would be one being it, created it on my eyeball yeah it's a scary thought and i will say like when i went in i told the doctor like i don't like that i don't like it at all and he was like yeah most people don't like it and are freaked out by it and he said i've done about thirty five thousand procedures and i was like has the numbing i asked have the numbing drops ever not worked on someone and he was like no they have never not worked and i was like what if i'm the first one and he's like biologically that isn't possible because of the way like he really was like because of the way your eyes are you know the drops are going to work blah 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 and um i was like okay I guess that's all I need to know. I guess that's the, all you will know. The so. end. <laughs> <laughs> ah, geez. Well, I I am proud of you. That's a Thank big step. You. I I've been considering it for many years. So, uh, you know, if you're out there and you're considering it, this is your sign. I say go for it. I'm not liable for any lasers or flap situations, but I say go for it. I'm. I also never want to be responsible for a flap ever. <laughs> so. Mm -mm. <laughs> I guess that's it. Christine, I got a good story for you this time around. Oh, I have a good one for you, too. I'm excited for this episode. I, um, sorry, that was a very nice gulp of lead and fog. Um, sweet Allison made it for me, the little witch. Okay, so here's your story this week. I found it, um, very last minute because I, we discussed, um, stigmatized property laws last mm -hmm. week. And I was like, huh. And in one of the articles below, one of the sources was like, you might also like this. And I went, well, surely I will, because <laughs> the title is The Union Screaming House. What? So, and... Uh, That's funny, because my reaction when they're like, you may like this, I'm like, you don't know what I like. And then it's always <laughs> like, obviously something I will like. And I'm like, how did you know that? You know, after I used to be that way, but after TikTok, you know, it's oh, algorithm sure. you is, trust the algorithm, right? It's just too strong at this point. I I used to fight it, and now if someone says, and by someone I mean TikTok, uh, if TikTok says you'll like this, I go, you already fucking know I will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't even fight you on this. The TikTok could tell me I have the most like unhinged illness <laughs> that no one's ever heard of and was eradicated it's from called hand, fu foot, and mouth disease. <laughs> And they would be like, hey, by the way, you have this exact thing. The symptoms haven't shown yet, but trust us. And I'd be like, oh, my God, I need That's a doctor. really bad. Em. I hope you I hear know. yourself saying that and realize it's just slightly problematic <laughs> for it yourself. Is. I, at the very least, would be like, why did you put me here? What's coming? You know, I'd be You'd like, be like they know something I don't know. Yeah. Uh, every day. Every day I wonder how I end up in certain places in the world of sex talk. Anyway, the algorithm brought me to the Union Screaming House, I, I guess, wait. this time around. Um, and by algorithm, I mean Google. I don't know if their algorithm is as advanced as TikTok these days, but I don't know. <sighs> Here's the situation. One of my favorite things about this location is that I would say 90% of these notes, if eh, 90, let's stick with 90% of the notes are the firsthand account of the guy who dealt with oh us. i feel like we don't often get a first-hand account so that's nice. it's so hard i do i i really applaud you all the time with all the true crime nonsense you have to read because <laughs> nonsense indeed well nonsense for for your mind because i feel like that has to be 
deteriorating you in some way. Um, and that's why we drink, colon, nonsense for your mind. <laughs> that's good, Em. I like it. TM, Thank TM, you. TM. And, um, but I, I do envy you a lot in that you get so many firsthand accounts. And mine are always just, like, rooted in alleged folklore. I see what made... you're saying. Yeah. So when I don't get a random legend from he said, she said, it's, right. I'm, I'm always impressed with myself that I even found it, but really Google found it. So yeah, the algorithm did it for the you algorithm. for yeah. once, for once. So, uh, the guy's name is Stephen Lachance. Um, and I'm just going to start with a quote from him. Okay. Do you believe in ghosts? I used to be like many of you. I was a true skeptic. A is true... this like the start of a Nickelodeon show? Do you believe in ghosts? I used to be like many of you. It sounds you probably like we're starting wondered how I got here. A, a, a comedy of epic proportions. Well, so uh, it is a book that he wrote. Oh, okay. I was like, who is he talking to? It sounds like he's talking to me as a 15-year-old watching the Disney Channel. <laughs> yeah, I was like a, a little, little old when I discovered the Disney Channel. Sorry. He's got a little um, like uh, green screen stick. Yes. He's... Yes. Precisely. By the way, I found out that that was literally a drumstick wrapped in green screen tape. No. I wanted it, I wanted it to be something so much cooler, but it makes so much sense they would just kind of like well, schlep it together. I never know? thought of it, but it does seem like it would at least be like a cool lightsaber toy or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Well, go figure. Yeah. Do you believe in ghosts? I used to be like many of you. I was a true skeptic, a true disbeliever. That was me until three years ago. Now I do believe. I wish I didn't. It would be easier for me to sleep at night. Even now, three years later, I'm still woke up in the min in the night by the memory of the screaming man, the child in pain, and the dark, ghostly image that turned my world upside down and changed my beliefs forever. You're probably wondering how I ended up here. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. Um, oh, no, he literally said, that was me. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, that got dark. But You know, um, but he, he knew the shtick. He knew that that captivates people. And he totally. went, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fucking lean into I'm it. So captivated and i gotta say some of his writing was actually pretty funny so um oh, good. i mean sound i told you sounds like we're starting a comedy it got dark pretty quickly i didn't expect that but uh yeah he's a, <laughs> he sounds like he he's a good communicator he's a good writer he did and i watched a few of his interviews i don't know too much about him but based on his interviews he seems like just a very lovely guy okay um, That's good. so now we're in may 2001 this is in union missouri and Stephen and his three kids were looking for a new place to live. The kids, I found out, their names were all forms of Eli. Huh? So Eliza, Elliot, and then I thought maybe like the next one would be Elijah, but it's just Eli. Oh, they were like, <laughs> we ran out. We just cut off then. I, I wonder if they had like a problem with the je part or something. So it's but Eliza. Sorry, say it again. El Eliza, Elliot. A, oh, 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 okay. That's probably and, why they didn't do the Elijah. Eliza, Elijah. Oh, uh, maybe if they were close. twins, that might have been fun. I feel like it'd be the least fun because you'd be like, Elijah, no, Eliza. No, Eli mm. it sounds incredibly complicated. Also, I feel like in some languages or dialects, maybe the je and za are a little it's too probably close. Probably similar, yeah. So Eliza, Elliot, and just good old Eli. So <laughs> okay. I like how the buck stops here with just. Yeah, we're done. Uh, so they f it's the three kids, and I, I tried to figure out their ages. I know one of them was 11, and I don't know if that was the oldest or the youngest, though. I was some. I am very confused about that, but okay. they're all, um, you know, living at home age. And I think they all seem to be around like maybe middle school, early high school. That was the okay. feeling I was getting. Um, they find out about this one large house, which they had just come from an apartment and it was a guy and his three kids. And he was mm -hmm. like, I, we need to expand for sure. So they find this big house and they're kind of at their wits end. It sounds like they had been looking everywhere for a house for a while and they needed a place right away. They found this house. It was two floors with three bedrooms. Um, so he goes to check it out uh, with one of the kids at an open house. Apparently this house is huge. It's very ornate. It's very elegant. There are literal cherubs lining the walls. With, uh, someone painted them on there. Okay. Um, in the basement, it had a fruit cellar and it also had a butcher shower. Do you know what that is? Ew, No. Okay, I had to figure it out too. Is that where they butcher the butcher showers after he cuts everything mm -hmm. up? Mm -hmm. 
Fuck. So if you have an older <sighs> house and you have a concrete shower in your cellar for some reason and you don't know why that's there, it's because that used to be, af- especially in like maybe more rural areas, I think a lot of houses still have that if you're like in the hunting culture. I see. Um, but it seems like it was kind of from a few decades ago, but a lot of people just still randomly have like a cement shower in their basement that maybe is near a back door. And it was so you could... If your cellar was fully concrete at the time with a drain on, in the floor, it was just easy to slaughter your animals, and then you could shower without dragging blood through the house. Cute. That's thoughtful, I guess. I mean, I understand it. I do. I just am pretty we're grossed just out. We're just so not I'm, of that life. No, we're not. And I'm just picturing the smell, and it's just gruesome. What's it smell like, Christine? Blood. Just blood, 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 blood. Just nasty. Gross. It made me want to I literally blow my nose. It you was so- asked me. I didn't want to say it, but... Smell of blood is such a... Once you've smelt it, you can never not smell it. Ugh. Once um, you smelt it, you probably dealt it. So check yourself because you might be bleeding. <laughs> I don't have a witty <laughs> report of P- that. but it's my PSA for today. <laughs> <laughs> you said what? You say? <laughs> That's your saying for today? My what PSA. A... Oh, well, thank God you found one. We're really scraping the bottom of the we barrel were, now. <laughs> yeah, we were lost. We were the... Po- what was it? The nonsense that ruins your brain or whatever. Um, I think if our... If our tagline is something about nonsense riding your brain, it makes sense that our brains would slowly forget. You our know. brains are just evolving. Yeah, we change the slogan every time because we can't remember. That's a good point. Something about nonsense every time. Okay, every so, time. So there's a butcher shower, which I had to learn about, and I didn't really enjoy learning about that. Um, there was a fruit cellar in the basement, um, and then the cherub. So interesting about the cherubs is that this place... This home, if you can't guess from my side of um, this paranormal podcast, Mm. this house is haunted. So it's Mm. interesting that there were cherubs lining the walls. And in an interview, Stephen responded because they were like, oh, isn't that weird? Like, maybe they already felt like they need to put like angels around Mm -hmm. the house to make it safe. His comment back was people don't realize that Satan was a cherub. (gasps) Oh, God. What the fuck? You just gave me goose cam out of nowhere. And I was like, Steven, you came back real hot with that answer. That was... I knew this guy was something else, this Steven. He said, I, I'm i ready for that comment. I've been thinking about this one for a while. I've been he literally on. was so prepared for someone to finally ask him about those cherubs. In his head, he was like, this is my moment. This, this is, is it, it. Steve. Yeah. You got this. <laughs> so he... Um, anyway, he didn't know at the time. He just saw cherubs. And I guess his daughter was like in an angel phase and so Aww. he was like oh that's great she'll have a good time with this and does you know, he mean I... a satanic phase or like an actual <laughs> angel phase no that's your daughter that's oh, right sorry <laughs> i got him confused when all of a sudden there's like melted candles and like pentagrams by the butcher shower we'll know by know, the where, butcher shower oh, where no. others stood oh, no so he was very excited about the house they were really blown away by the size of it I don't know what the situation is. Maybe I looked up the wrong address, but I zillowed it because that's what we did last week. The house didn't seem that big in comparison to like what I usually hear are big houses, but I am also aware that they just came from an apartment and it yeah, probably like, seemed massive. Say it's like a one or two bedroom apartment. They're all sharing bedrooms. Yeah, they're probably really cramped in there. Yeah, four, this was three a kids huge and change. Grown-up. Yeah, it feels like a, a big adjustment to probably have like... I mean, your own walls around you, your own address, your own yard. Yeah. Well, I I was actually going to say one of the things they were really excited about was the yard because they didn't Mm. have one. So I think it all all felt really big. Sure. Um, And so Stephen said that the uh, he asked the landlady for an application and the landlady has the goddamn nerve to say this right away. You understand the responsibilities that come with living in an old house such as this, don't you? Was that Cindy? She was like, I... (laughs) (laughs) This landlady, by the way, is for those who are listening backwards for some unknown reason, um, Cindy is someone we talked about in our last episode where (laughs) she runs a, uh, like, I don't know, some uh, consulting business for people who are trying to sell their haunted homes. Right, right. She basically helps you sell your, like, stigmatized property, your haunted home. Um, And I feel like that's kind of what she's doing here. She's like, you're accepting all liability for this old, old house. And this landlady probably could have taken some tips from Cindy. Um, Mm. But this landlady, as I heard in many interviews, 
is a real fucking character and mm. maybe not in the best way. Um, oh no. She seems a little too erratic and oh, she, no. if they made a movie, I think they would like dress her in like a feather boa. She seems a little, Oh no. Unhinged in some ways. Gotcha. That's the vibe I'm getting. She I, got I can't LASIK be sure. eye surgery that morning and people were like, <laughs> she cannot get a fucking grip. That's so weird. Cause my next bullet is he calls her a Gemini bulldozer. That's why. <laughs> oh boy. Um, <laughs> So she says, you understand the responsibilities of what a house like this entails, basically. And he didn't know what that meant. He was like, uh, yeah, that it's old. Sure. Okay, sure. So he said the landlady showed the house off in a weird way, like it was almost a museum. And pretty much within the week, she said, oh, we want you to move in. Ugh. So they move in Memorial Weekend, and as Stephen is grabbing some of the last boxes out of the moving truck to bring into the house, a car slows down in front of the house, and the passenger shouted, hope you get along here, okay? And then the car just drove off really quick. <laughs> and that's when the dad was in the car was like, now, now we wait to see how they react to that. What a fun prank. See, I would be holding those boxes that I just took out of the truck, and i just put them right back in. You'd be like, go. and on that note... <laughs> I'd be like, okay, well, I guess oh I'm God. not moving in here. Um, so this is a quote from Stephen. I, I just threw a lot of his like direct quotes in because it just otherwise I was gonna just be summarizing what he'd already done. So, um, he says the first night in the house went by without fanfare, maybe because we were so tired from the move, or perhaps because the house wanted to draw us in a little closer before beginning its series of attacks and assaults upon me and my family. <sighs> So the first morning, I guess, starts a little weird because he notices, now that he's getting a better look at the house, he's going in and out of the rooms, he notices that each door had hooks and latch locks on the wrong side of the doors. <gasps> so That's never good. The quote from him is, the latches were on the outside of the rooms as if to keep something in. Oh my God, that's like the Skinwalker Ranch house. Like, immediately, I... I'd be like, where are those boxes I meant to put back in the truck? Serious. They're still in the trunk, probably. Yeah. So later that day, Stephen um, is hanging up a picture, and it had two angels in it. And um, he was like, well, I'll hang this in the chair room, I guess. So he, he tries to hang it on the wall. Then he walks away. And as he's oh. walking away, it crashes to the ground. Oh, no. He hangs it up a second time, crashes to the ground. Third time, he's walking away, and he feels something hit his ankles and the picture had flown off the wall and hit him. It was like, how many times do I have to tell you? Yeah. It was like, are you fucking kidding me? Jeez. So Stephen was, he was like, oh my God, stay on the fucking wall. So he hangs it up again. Oh my and God. Wow. He's really fucking commit. <laughs> he's stubborn. It sounds familiar to me, but I can't think of who it might be with this right, bulldozing right. kind of characteristic. Yeah. It's crazy. I wonder. I wonder. I wonder too. I wonder if he nailed the curtains to the wall also, just to see what would happen. I wonder if he just, like, nailed this picture up through the canvas through or something. The just... art, yeah. <laughs> um, so he hangs it up again, and this time it doesn't move. Uh, so he's like, okay, I'm going to slowly back out of this room. <laughs> and he hears the daughter on the porch say, Dad, come look at this. No. And... This is a separate instance. It's just weird that they overlapped, but he now goes outside to see his kids on the porch and they're watching the neighbors because the neighbors that are on their side of the street, anytime they're walking towards the house, they will cross the street before continuing to walk past the house. Oh, they don't... no. And he's like, <laughs> of course, his daughter, who I imagined before I tried to figure out their ages, I imagined she was like four, so it was extra creepy. But the daughter says... They don't like walking in front of our house. Isn't that weird? And like, <laughs> so Stephen then spent the next three hours watching neighbors do this. And then if he tried to like say hi to them or wave, they would literally like dip their heads and ignore him. This is like the definition example of what you talked about last week. The stigmatized property. Like people Truly. are stigmatizing the whole family and they didn't even know. I'm telling you that algorithm knew. They're like, it "Hey, <laughs> if you like uh if you like these types of co these things like stigmatized property, this will do. This will do." do. But yeah, the whole neighborhood is like against this. They're like, it's "We don't good. even want to look. We don't want to know them." And uh so 
at the same time, the kids are starting to notice things too. The son, he's noticing that he's waking up to things, walking in the hallways, and he mm. thinks it's maybe his dad. Um, there's a box of toys that he still hadn't unpacked and they would move by themselves. The toys would get taken out of the box and he'd think it was his siblings. <gasps> he would wake up feeling stared at and Ugh. no one was in the room. But anyway, so one of these days, uh, they decide it's going to be a big work and play day out in the yard. And again, this is a big deal because they hadn't had a yard before, mm -hmm. um, or at least not at their last place. And Stephen noticed that the trees were acting weird, which I didn't even know to pay attention to plant behavior. Were they acting like normally? I think, so he said that the leaves were dropping, like it was about to get really cold out, like the seasons were changing. And so I think that was kind of a nod to the fact that like even plants were dying on the property. <gasps> Um, it doesn't really get mentioned again, but I did think it was weird that like now that he, as he was writing the book, he was probably thinking back and everything just felt like a fucking sure. symptom. So, um, so anyway, he asks one of his sons or maybe both of his sons to, I think it was one of his sons to go get the garden hose from the basement and kid runs down to the basement with the butcher shower, of course. And a few minutes later, Steven hears his son screaming in the house and runs to find him shaking in the kitchen and he i think well it says that he peed himself um oh, he was no. so scared um poor baby and he said something chased me up the basement steps and when oh. steven asked what it was the son said i don't know daddy but it was big oh buddy that's so traumatizing yeah and terrifying to an adult can you imagine if leona said it was big like it yeah. was so they didn't find anything in the basement, obviously. And after this, nothing really happens for a few days. But soon Stephen catches on that every time they come home, all of the lights in the house are on. Um, Whoa. He thinks it's the kids. It's like it feels mocking because it's literally every single light. Um, mm. And he thinks it's his kids. And eventually he walks through the room and turns off every single light before they leave one night. And when he comes back, they're all on. No. While he was walking through the house and, like, trying to figure out why all the lights had come on, he realized it was so hot that he was, like, sweating. But his daughter was in the living room and said, Daddy, it's cold. No. No, no. He, he goes into the living room and it's dropped, like, 30 degrees. And then Stephen says, that was the first time I felt its presence. Ah! He said it felt like an electrical current coursing through his body. And after that, it left, uh, it left and he didn't have that feeling anymore. And the temperature rose back to normal. And he even watched the thermostat go up 30 degrees. Oh, um, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Soon after that, the family is talking all in the same room together. And it's right before bedtime. And the kids' backs, they were, um, the back, their backs were facing the living room. Stephen was looking into the living room. And he even was quoted saying, like, thank God, because I'm or something like, I'm so glad that they didn't see what I saw. <gasps> because as he's talking to them in the living room, he sees a man standing there. And this is a quote, except there was a moving, churning, dark gray, black smoke or mist that made up his form. Mm. A few moments pass. And I was sure that when I looked up again, that it would be gone. But he was still there and he began to move, <gasps> moving into the family room and pausing in the center of the room. His form was still a mass of churning, turning blackness. He stood there for what seemed an eternity, but in actuality, it was only a few moments and then he melted into the air. Oh, God. I mean, it's like such a fucked up thing because it like breaks the cliche of like, I glanced back and he was gone. It's like, no, you glance back and he's like. I can move closer. I can't think of anything more, um, uh, like, uh, more convincing of an intelligent being. Because I feel like if you glance up and it's gone, then like, oh, maybe I missed, maybe I caught something or, oh, that wasn't mm -hmm. for me. We're just existing in the same space. But like, when you look up again, I, I just, to me, it always feels like it wants you to see yes. this. And it knows that you expect it to be gone is what it feels like. Like it, yeah. It's and I feel like, like surprise. <laughs> I feel like even like, like ghosts that you love and like that you wish you could see more of, they're still polite enough to not freak you out <laughs> that they're gone when you look up. But they're like, we'll just make this really brief. <laughs> Yeah, like even like there are times where I've glanced and I thought I saw 
like my grandpa or something and i like wished that when i looked up again he was there yeah. but like even they don't do that so i feel like if you look up and see something it's it feels sinister immediately because okay, it's breaking another, the rules another like thought it is break, breaking it's breaking like, the rules breaking exactly. etiquette breaking the etiquette the ghostly etiquette and i i will all say on that note when you say like oh if a good spirit is around and you know only shows itself briefly that also makes me wonder like does this thing just have so much more power that it can hang around for as long as it wants versus oh. maybe it takes a lot of energy for a spirit to like present themselves even for a moment but then like if he's like no i can even walk around a bit like does that mean he's just super strong too i don't like it yeah i hate that or like maybe what if you have good spirits next to you and it's like sucking up their energy and it's oh god he's like I, I, yeah we'll hey hey let's keep making it worse um yeah let's just <laughs> theorize on how bad this could get well so he sees this moving black mass who is aware of him and wants him to see him uh, cool. presumably Great. um and this is where some of his writing was really funny because he was like in my calmest dad voice i said <laughs> let's go get a soda and see grandma and like <laughs> oh he's like want to get ice cream and they're like why which no like reason. I, I appreciate the vulnerability because i feel like we've already started in a space that's you know not the cookie cutter like we've mm -hmm. got a single dad with his three right. kids you don't get that a lot and he seems to be incredibly close with all of his children and then also in interviews i've seen recently he's so proud of all of his kids like he's just like so, i just i really like this guy um i hope i really hope that there, there's like not something about him i'm unaware oh, no. of but he seems very kind and, and wonderful um and i just i think it's also really interesting that he was so quick to be like i was freaked the fuck out because i feel like a lot of dads would be like i'm macho and have to protect yeah, you know i thought i could fight it yeah zach bagans with three children in the house oh was... god no i don't want to <laughs> see that i don't want to know but um no but he very i like that he you know if he feels a little human of like the second i saw that i also did not want to fucking be there let's, let's be skedaddle clear. yeah I just appreciate the honesty. So he was like, in my calmest dad voice, he said, let's go get a soda. And I guess even his kids were like, it's about to be my bedtime and I get to go have a soda. Like, yeah, I mean, like no questions asked. I am following you to the car. Good <laughs> so, choice. Because honestly, you wouldn't have liked the answer. So just yeah. go get the ice cream. So they all head to the door before they can get to the door. Oh, fuck. They hear a man in the house screaming in pain at inhuman levels oh no oh my god so loud that the neighborhood can truly hear the sense since his time there uh neighbors have reported like oh yeah we could all hear it we all heard what it. steven yells at the kids to run to the car he's like fuck the soda thing get out of the house <laughs> oh no and as he drove away we just sped off into the night one of his sons in the car said daddy the basement monster is standing in the upstairs window <gasps> steven looked at the window and he saw the same figure he'd seen downstairs looking back at them from the window and the kid is like yeah that's the big thing that chased me out of the basement <laughs> yep fuck so they stayed at grandma's for the weekend good <laughs> And then the kids ended up, they were already planning on being there for a week because Stephen had to leave town for work. Um, but while he was gone for work, I think he just had enough time away from the house that he was able to, like, kind of, you know, I guess convince himself that it yeah. wasn't as bad as he thought. And Which so, I think we would all probably do, or at least try to do. Especially, I mean, this is, like, the classic family who moved into a haunted house that they spent way over budget just trying to make things work they invested all their money this and is time like their into forever home and they, oh. they really need this to work because they don't have any other options like it just it sounded like he didn't have much of a choice and he had yeah, to convince shame. himself yeah and i understand i mean even if we did have a choice i feel like our natural reaction is to try and rationalize it yeah definitely so he's like okay i'm gonna grab the kids from my mom and we're gonna go back to the house everything's gonna be fine mm. Well, now that he's back at home with the kids, he is looking through the shed one day and he finds a bunch of items that the last tenant or tenants had left there mm. in the shed. Um, and he's like, his his mom, I also love that he's like very close with his parents. Me and too. He was, he was telling them what was going on. So even they were like, I guess, getting updates about how haunted this fucking house was. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> and his parents were like, you need to call your landlady and be like, what the fuck is going Seriously. on? Seriously. Is this place haunted? Which, if there were more protection laws about stigmatized property, Great maybe point. if he asked in advance, they 
he would have gotten a response. I don't know. She seems still, again, a little like she would be the person who would not honorably answer that. Yeah. And so we're in uh, Missouri, right? So they would have to jump on the um, New York, New Jersey bandwagon. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That I think I don't remember what I said about Missouri, but it wasn't one of the four states that have anything no. direct, directly about the paranormal in their right. um, dis they just disclosure it. laws. Right. So I think he could have asked and still not gotten anything. So yeah, it was by way. the book. But I feel like a story like this is a perfect reason why there should be more disclosure laws about the paranormal. I mean, to be honest, like I would just ask, what is this shower for? And if they were like a butcher in the sho <laughs> shower, but butcher shower, I'd be like, actually, I'm not interested. I'm stigmatized against this property now. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's would have saved enough. us all a lot of trouble, folks. Just saying. I, I hear you. I honestly would have... I would have tried to like piece that together. I think I would have seen like a whole cement cellar and been like, I know some bad. You would have looked at here. this thing from ten miles away and been like, Nope, it's haunted. I just beg to differ. I think the angels would have made me feel uncomfy. Me too. I'd be like, Why do you need to be here? What's like, the what's, situation? Yeah, what are you doing here? <laughs> what are you looking at, by the way? <laughs> I'm just yeah. trying to eat my fucking pot chicken pot pie, Marie Callenders. Leave me alone. So Maybe when off. When he, uh, oh, so his parents like, you need to call the landlady and ask what's going on. So he got back. He sees the stuff in the shed. And now that he knows that there were previous tenants and he never heard their stories, he's going to call the landlady. He asks her about any ghosts. Landlady conveniently can't remember. Oh, good. She and like then, takes her bow on. She's like, hmm. Yeah. Flick it behind her. <laughs> her like her, her like scroll and quill to like, let me, <laughs> let me check my notes. Huh? Ghost, ghost. I don't think so. <laughs> but she does say, "Oh, you know what's so interesting? Hmm, interesting, interesting, hmm. interesting. Um, is that I? I don't know about any ghosts, but I do know the stuff in the shed belonged to former occupants who just casually fled in the middle of the no! night. No, come on. <laughs> and when Stephen asked how long anyone had lived there before him, this was in 2001. The house was built in the early 1930s. And I don't know how long this landlady has been in charge, but to her knowledge, how long has anyone ever lived here? And she, again, very casually basically said a year. Oh, um, no. That is not a good sign. Uh, his parents are still in the know about this. They've come over. Her, his dad said that he would hear, quote, a herd of elephants upstairs. He would hear the screams of a little girl in the <gasps> house. Um also, one of the sons, this is fucking crazy. One of the sons got brave to like go to the bathroom by himself, which the fact that he's already scared to go to the bathroom That's by himself. Sad. He walks down the hall and he sees this smoky figure appear in the hall and he's staring at the smoke and it begins to morph into the face of a clown with no eyes. <gasps> This is so messed up. This is like when they say that they know what your fears are and they just mm -hmm. manipulate that. Oh, clown with no eyes. It sounds like it knew my fears and I didn't no, even know it my sounds own like fears. It knew. You're right. It's probably everyone's deepest fear, honestly. A few days after this, Stephen is on the phone with his mom while the kids are in his room and he starts to hear the doors rattling and he thinks it's the kids from the other room. He tells him to stop playing games. The doors rattle a little harder. He says to stop. He's on the phone. They rattle even harder and the doors are shaking like crazy. Mm. All of the doors. So he already, he's like, I have only three kids. One, two, three. <laughs> oh shit. But the doors are freaking out. He scolds them still thinking they like, you know, did something or like were playing prank. a trick on him. Yeah. So he scolds him and says, cut it out. And then the door starts to rattle again. And he hears his daughter say, I'm reading and my brothers are asleep. <gasps> Well, they're not anymore. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> yeah. And as she said that, the temperature dropped 30 degrees. And just like last time, with the temperature drop came an electrical surge that hit Stephen's body. And this time it was paired with an awful stench, which we've talked about before is yeah. ingredient number one for a demon. Yeah. It's like pretty obvious formula there. And as Stephen is feeling this energy, smelling this stench, it's cold and the doors are shaking. He begins to hear a scream and the scream gets louder and louder and louder until it's impossibly loud. And the doors oh. are shaking. The floor is shaking. The house is booming. He's hearing the screams and his mom is still on the phone and he screams into the phone. I don't know if he like can't grab the phone. He's paralyzed or if he's still on the phone with her. But he says, you need to come over. Help us. We're leaving. And yeah. as he says, we're leaving. 
quote, then the whole house began to come alive. Oh, no, I thought it was all going to stop, but it gets, it just kept going. The house freaks out. It's rattling everywhere. The man screaming is getting louder. He's hearing boom, boom, boom of something running down the stairs at him. Then Stephen sees the floor shaking and he tries to get to the bedroom to grab his kids. And he says, I felt something behind me and I knew I didn't want to turn around to see it. Boom, screaming, boom. A new scream mixed into the man's scream. This one was from a child. Boom, screams, boom, screams. Oh, no. I made it to my bedroom door, but it wouldn't open. And by this time, I too am screaming, throwing myself against the door and it still wouldn't budge. So now oh, he can't no. get to his kids. Oh, no. He's throwing his body into the door to get to his kids. Finally, the door opens and he tells the kids to run to the car, house still shaking and screaming everywhere. He grabs his daughter and tries to run for it, but then the door behind them flies open as if something was trying to follow them through the house. Holy shit. He says, this is a quote from him. It was on our trail and I knew I couldn't let it reach us, like chase them out of the, or right. follow them out of the house. The whole house was shaking and alive with noise and something big on our heels. When we reached the front door and out onto the porch, I slammed the front door behind us. As we got in the car, we could still hear the noise coming from inside the house. I drove away and parked at the top of the street where I could still see the house and wait for my parents to arrive. We could see it searching through the house. No! Searching for us. It's blackness moving from room to room methodically. That was our last night in the house. I sure hope so. Which I like that he straight, again, this makes it feel a little more human that because we always say like, which I know it's a privileged thing to say, like, why don't you just leave? And like, mm -hmm. there's always all this, you know, laundry list of reasons that are all valid. But I like that this guy was like, I fled once and I came back. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. I'm the fuck out of here. Yeah, I'm like, not <laughs> participating any longer. And so uh, Stephen would... So that was their last night in the house. That was the last time the kids went there. But the uh, there were a few times where Stephen had to go back to grab things. But he That's never the went. Worst. He never went back alone. Um, but something would always happen while he was there. People would either hear whispers or breathing or. Um, anyway, so he goes to the landlady to turn his keys over, literally covered in bruises from trying to th break the store down. She gaslights the shit out of him. She says. Sure. Some people are meant to live in an old house like that, and some people aren't. And I never thought you were the old house type. She's a lunatic, and she's not very nice. Like, girl, you live there. Um, right, why don't you move in, lady? <laughs> yeah, you, you love this house so much. Um, so it only took, uh, that whole story was only 13 days, not even a full two weeks. Oh my god, That I assumed it was spread out much longer. So that was like, bam, 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 bam. It started... <sighs> very hot and so it only took 13 days for the family to flee um and to this day he says the scariest thing to happen to him in that house was just the constant sound of someone breathing over his shoulder ah which is so weird because like all the other things did not freak him out the same way but the breathing freaked him out i can see that though i feel like that would be just like a, a fear that you have every day now like is someone just gonna start breathing behind me and i know it's gonna all start again well, I guess it was like a, a more sinister and like it's letting you know it's there. And like if it wanted to do more, it could. Yeah, at exactly. Any so what I'm saying is like maybe he still fears it. Like if I hear that sound again, I know it's like followed me and can do it mm -hmm. in this new place. So a month later, a friend tells Stephen to look up John Crow, Captain John Crow. And this guy apparently used to be the property owner and we found out that um when he lived there the land dated back to the civil war and he was a slave owner um it doesn't say it in that few of words but they danced around it nicely but um, Ooh, he, don't you love that he definitely had enslaved people on his property yeah and um so also nearby they were, they were trying to i there was one source that like tried to like look up the property or the land near the property to see if there were other reasons for all this. They found out there was other like violent death activity um, in, in other houses nearby that could have been on John mm -hmm. Crow's original property. It could have all been mm -hmm. the same plot at one point, but someone else was homicidal. Someone else was suicidal, some, which like I, that could be anything else, but people were trying to piece as much together as they could. Also nearby is Union City Park, which is said to have several mass graves on the property. So that could oh contribute boy. to the spirits. Um, apparently after Stephen, uh, the next family very quickly fled in the middle of the night. 
Um, other families have moved in there. For a second, I guess the landlady gave up and it became like a dog kennel, which I can't imagine those poor fucking oh, dogs. Oh, no. Um, I don't think it's a dog kennel anymore. I think other people have tried living there also. Um, allegedly, at some point, the Roman Catholic Church put out a 156-page report about the house they classified it the Union Screaming House Haunting, and they called the house a, quote, demonic infestation, oppression, obsession, and possession. But, like, nobody asked them to do this. Like, That's apparently, very weird. Like, Stephen did not, he found out after it already happened. That is so, so odd. Like, why? Yeah. And then, and then I, like, obviously I couldn't find the reports. I don't know. Maybe they found out there were, like, angels on the walls, and they were like, we got to put this straight, okay? Yeah, they were like, well, hang on. If we're talking about cherubs all of a sudden, well, Satan was a cherub. Let me get in on this. <laughs> so uh, that's when we get to the quote. Stephen says, I do believe in ghosts. I still drive past that house every once in a while. And when I get enough nerve, I look up at the upstairs window Oof. and it's still there. Watching, waiting, angry. Sometimes its screams still wake me from my sleep. And in my dreams, I see a faceless man standing in that basement, washing away blood from his naked body. Oh! Grunting, panting, breathing. <gasps> oh, God. Oh, my God. I just got chills, like, from the scalp all the way down. Um. So he's become you know, pretty well known for this house and neighbors still reach out to him or, you know, people who have lived in or near the property or on the property have all reached out to him and he's built up a little community, but he's reached out to his old neighbors and asked why they never warned him. And they all pretty much said, because I knew you wouldn't be there for that long anyway. They were like, no... we didn't want to become friends. We knew you'd be gone by the yeah, end they of the like, week. Nobody ever lasts. Uh, what? The and the neighbors, like I said, they did confirm that they would hear screams. They constantly still see shadows and figures in the windows. And he, uh, Stephen himself was like, anyone who has lived in that neighborhood knows what's going on there. Jesus. Um, after he left the house, uh, in an interview, someone was like, so did anything follow you after that? I remember they left in 2001. Stephen says that after he left the house, something followed him until 2011, 10 years later. Oh, no. That's a long attachment. And very poltergeist activity. He would walk into the kitchen with his drawers and cabinets all open. And one time he found all of his knives lined up in a row on the floor. Oh, fuck. That's really bad. Interestingly, I don't know if the connection is there or not, but I'm very quickly making a connection that in 2011 the reason that it stopped after that is he had open heart surgery and died on the table and it um, pretty much all went away after but, that like survived like like he's, he, he died oh, on the he, table he, but he then came back to life died on the table and came back oh, okay but, uh, <laughs> i was but like well then, yeah he's dead em of course it stopped <laughs> <laughs> but then um but no so after that nothing's oh. really followed him and so i wonder if this thing had some sort of commitment to like follow him until his death and then he like came back and gets to redo it i don't know i don't know what the what rules are the fuck yeah maybe he severed some tie. connection yeah. yeah maybe like in that life they had a connection and in this life it's i don't know like a technicality the guy had to move on yeah it's like a technicality yeah um i don't know that's my guess but it's interesting he did say that something still follows him a little bit but like the lights go on and off and that's really it um he was talking about his open heart surgery and terrifying for me. He said, I've noticed that a lot in the paranormal community. A lot of people in the paranormal world have heart problems. Ah! Ah, M, stop. So I don't know. Fucking anyway, fantastic. Great news. I, I had to stare into the void for a little bit after that. Um, in 2008, Stephen wrote the uninvited, the true story of the union screaming house. And later he wrote blessed are the wicked, which is the sequel to that um he's also written other books but those two are about his experiences in the house and after writing the book he gained some notoriety online he got in touch with one of the newer tenants who lived there and uh her name was helen and she was being terrorized at the house um around the time he wrote this book besides hearing noises like breathing next to her and someone coming up and down the stairs um some of the things that she experienced were quote Light bulbs keep blowing. The gutters catch on fire. The transformer in the front of the house blows up every few months. The hair is cut off of her daughter's dolls, though the girl denies doing it herself. Oh. And far, far worse. I'm so sorry, Christine. They got a new kitten 
No, what? And and when Helen takes her granddaughter upstairs to see it in a bedroom, the granddaughter said, I found the cat dead on the floor. Its neck and back were both broken. And what the fuck? Her grandson, I don't know if it was the granddaughter or Helen who said that, but that's what they found. Her <sighs> Her grandson says something tried to push him down the stairs, injuring him. The police turn up in the middle of the night, claiming someone had made a suicide call from the house, and Helen was the only one home and had not made the call. What the fucking fuck? So she's somehow having, like, an even worse... Yeah. T- I mean, people. I wonder if she's been dying. there longer. I think she had been. I mean, longer than 13 days, yeah. Right. And even worse, she claims that she was being <gasps> R-worded. By this thing um and eventually it gets so bad that helen spirals mentally which again i will caveat that this could mean an attachment it could also mean actual mental illness that needs to be taken well, into I account mean, i'll be honest i'm kind of worried about this daughter too if it's like her doll's mm-hmm. hair's getting cut off and then her cat died like i'm not saying she did it i'm just saying it seems yeah. like some sort of psych evaluation should also yeah. be undertaken on the child i think all facets should be looked into mm. um Apparently, she really did start spiraling after living in the house. She started having homicidal thoughts. She started using language that was out of character. Her eyes became black. What? The entity not only affected her, but her friends. I guess Helen was starting to wonder if her husband was cheating on her, and her friends were encouraging her to stab him. What? This whole friend group is like uh, What's all of them need happening? to be. <laughs> they need like a Groupon for like therapy. Just they to need to just fly make to sure. different states and not talk again. I think. <laughs> I think so. Um, and uh, ev- eventually she was so possessed that she holds Stephen at gunpoint. The Stephen, like the fo- former Stephen, yeah, because he decided he was going to try to help her. Like, oh no. Because he had been there and he knew what, like how, what the terror of that house was like. So he tried to help her and then she like held him at gunpoint. She ended up going to a psychiatric hospital by the okay. way. And that's probably good either way. Um and st- uh, before any of that happened, Steve did really want to help her and so he tried to dig into the property's history. Um not only do they at first find very little, but they're like convinced that the library's archivists were like withholding information about the house mm. because there was so little about it. Uh, I don't like that. Um after all this, his career in the paranormal world also took off. He founded the Missouri Paranormal Research Society. He became a lecture speaker. He's been featured in like docu-series. He has a radio show. He they did an episode um called well, an episode of A Haunting called Fear House about his family. Um, and in that, actually, the story expands even further to after him, where the tenants after him eventually met with Stephen because Stephen had like a bad dream after he moved out of the house and felt like he needed to warn the next family. And all that mm-hmm. apparently is real because even that family was interviewed on the show. Oh, wow. So um, the the story continues, I guess, but it seems like no one stays longer than a year and eventually all of them seem to find each other. And now they've got like, you know, I'm sure they're all texting each other in a very scary group chat. Um, <laughs> oh no. But it seems like they find each other very quickly. So uh, I will say uh, there have been skeptics who say that his book is incredibly vague. It has no witness testimonies. The random 156 page report has not really been seen by anybody a lot of people think this was just to boost his career in the paranormal world um but i do think this is interesting like just to validate his experience is that quick fun fact he does do lectures about the house and one time he opened up a q a to the audience and the first person to raise her hand was the landlady no her boa just flew through the air (laughs) when she stood up and she went dear lord yeah (laughs) The smell of Chanel number five wafted <laughs> through the crowd. Mostly what did she this? say? She was being very snooty with him and like ready to call him out because it was making her look bad. But what she and Steven did not know was that apparently in the audience, they were like almost all other previous renters. Oh my God. She was like among her own tenants. Yes. And so some people pretty much went after her when she tried to attack Steven. He literally said the phrase, they took care of it. (gasps) And then I guess just to add like salt to like her as a wound, she apparently, uh, Steven said that she also used racial slurs 
And people, quote, people really took her down for that. So, well, yeah. Yeah. So she's not favor- favored by a lot of people. No. Um, especially all those fucking people were like, because there were no disclosure laws protecting them, all of these people, all these renters probably are like, are you fucking kidding me? You would let us in the house and like, Knew we would leave within the year. Like, and... whether she believes it or not, like, you'd think that if you can't even hold a tenant for more than a year, that, like, you should at least let the next renters know. I don't know. Exactly. Uh, so the investigators, or they've had investigators come to the house if they've, like, wanted that. I guess in times where nobody's living there, they've had investigators, or maybe they pay the people to leave for the night. I don't totally know. But investigators have gone. They've been pushed. They've been bitten. They also smell the same stench. Just driving by, it feels really weird. Uh, at least one of them has gotten a vision. I'm so sorry. Uh, they saw in one of the trees a baby hanging by its oh, foot. Um, um, what the fuck? And this apparently happened to a lot of people. People have had really terrible dreams. And then when they woke up, something really bad happened to something or someone that they love. Um, uh, wait, like people who are living there or, or just these like, investigators? And just, it, just the investigators will get like an attachment when they go to home? the house. Oh, no. So one person uh, told their story where uh, they had a, a dream. This is really going to be, I think, hard for you. Um, I, it's already been so hard. I don't like the things you already warned me about. Do you want me to skip this part? What's it about? It's more baby stuff. They, she had a dream that a clown was harming babies, and then she woke up, and a baby she knew was not doing hot. Okay. That's as, that's as vague as I can keep it. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Sorry. And then there was a, an investigator named Tracy uh, who said, the house caused a... But also, let's go back for a second and remember, like, another clown thing, right? Yeah, I, I remember. All right. So an investigator named Tracy said the house also caused a group of people to absolutely deteriorate within six months from each other. People were having horrible marital problems, personal problems, mental issues. They just turned into not nice people. And for some reason, everybody turned against each other in this group that we had. In a matter of weeks, everybody was hating everybody and personally attacking everyone. This house has this effect on people. It's depressing. Oh. It's oppressive. And I think that's how it works. It just wants to suck the life right out of you it just destroys anything good that you have oh my god i mean i'm not usually one to say i'm too scared to go somewhere i do not want to go near this fucking place i also don't want to go there um like i feel like typically i'm like oh i'll check it out even if i get scratched or bitten or whatever this is like a no-go like the curse and stuff and attachments and hurting people you love. No. I also heard something about how there used to be sacrifices on the property, but that I heard that from like one kind of vague source. So I don't know how true that is, but there were also um, a lot of um, enslaved people on the property. And then I heard one, one source say that um, all of the um, male enslaved people or all the enslaved men were um, killed on the property at one time because uh, that Captain Crow guy thought that his wife might be oh sleeping with them, aka fully R wording them. Let's yeah. be clear. Um, and so when he felt threatened, he probably did some really horrible things to them. So uh, the only good I tried to find something with levity here, and all cool. I could find I know all I could find was that this house was um built using a building kit from Sears. That's all I got. Are you serious? Yeah, they just bought it out of a catalog. Okay, that look that actually works for me because I have a picture of it and I think it's so cute. And I know you've seen it, but I'm sending this to the group chat because like you would not expect it to look this way. Like it, I mean, it it's adorable. I think. I I don't know what what picture you're gonna show me. Okay, I'll Let me send see. it to you. I think it, it was it was like a cute little home. I mean, it has like little like you can see that it was in a catalog, like a Sears catalog. It's this like tiny little. It just looks like a little cottage. It has like a little white... gingerbread. Yeah, it looks almost like gingerbread y. Like it has like shutters and like little white trim, scallop trim around the rooftop. And there's, I see now what he's saying when he says we would look at and see it upstairs. There's only one window you can see street facing upstairs. And so, like, if you were driving past, you could look in that one window and I guess presumably see a figure in there. And also, how did you find this 
address. Did you just look up Union Screaming House? Yes. I must have looked up something else then because the house I saw earlier wasn't this. But I also felt like something was off about that. It's I think you're the right. John Bauer House is what Wikipedia tells me. That's weird. I didn't even hear anything about John Bauer. Okay, wait, maybe that's the wrong house then. Hang on. Let me see. Because that house would make sense why they were impressed oh, with wait, how big it was. Oh, wait, that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. This oh. is in Illinois. I'm sorry. Union Screaming House. I did um, type in Union Screaming House. Missouri. So apparently Wikipedia misled me here. I'm sorry about that. Let me see. Address. So I think the... I have a, a link oh, to... Oh, I see it now. I'm sorry. You is, were, it a, yeah. is it a little white house? It's a big, actually a big white house. Jesus looks, Christ, we cannot find this thing. Okay, hang It on. looks big to me. Han, so send me the link. Oh, wait, no. That's the picture of I of the set that they used in the haunting episode. Oh, okay. my God. Oh I have God. a real picture of it, I'm pretty sure, and it is a small white house. Is it... That's the one. Yeah, that's... So that house... Okay, it's not quite as adorable as the one I found in Illinois, but, <laughs> but yeah. it's not, like, it doesn't... I can see now because when I saw that other house, it looked like out of a Sears catalog and it looked like quaint and precious. This one does look a little more ominous to me, but maybe it's just because I'm biased. Okay, so if you type that address in to Zillow, it's on Zillow. I'm it's... also looking at it on Go on Google Earth and there's a sign on the door that says no trespassing. Yep. So this is what I saw. Let me just send this to you. Um, the Zestimate is 130000 Fun okay. fact. Here, okay, here's just the link to the Zillow. Man, I wish it was this other cute house I found. Uh, you made it look real cute for a second. I'm like, wow, was... scallop lace trim on the... <laughs> that house, that's called the Union House in a different place. Mm -hmm. All right, let me see what you sent me. Yeah, 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 that's the one. Oi, it's scary. Anyway, that's what the house looks like. But it's, um, yeah, scary time, well, it's, man. it's off market, so... So apparently it's being remodeled but i don't know when that was that post was made so. yeah i saw that wow anyway that is the union screaming house oh um what a friggin' story man thank you i don't like it <laughs> i don't like that uh i i the story was probably one of my favorites you've ever done but oh it scared me, it scared me a bit well um yeah i i I watched a few of his interviews on YouTube. He has his own YouTube channel, of course, because he's like a dad. Uh, you can yeah. guess how the channel looks. It's about three videos and nothing else. Oh, um, but it's he's very. I think he one of them's like a compilation of like times they've had done interviews. Like he's very, I, I think, pr proud of it. So I love. I mean, good for him. I'm glad he made the most of it. I, I guess I just always wonder because I've been watching a lot of um, the Dead Files, which is one of my favorite uh ghost shows it's on discovery plus and basically what it is is there's one psychic medium named amy and i love she... dead files yeah oh you do okay and then there's the guy who's like a cop a dirt, like a, a new jersey cop or something new jersey cop and he basically is like has this accent like this new york i guess he's a new york sorry he's an nypd i think but he, yeah he's he, a he's a tough cookie to crack like you know? literally that's how he speaks so it's hilarious because <laughs> you have like this like psychic medium who's all kind of like woo and like up you know in just and this spooky. man's like real ass elliot stabler he's like literally oh, and they show his like <laughs> nypd ring and he's like I get to the bottom of the case and it's you want you want a knuckle sandwich Last yeah it's like a delight to watch because of their dynamic it's so weird but um <laughs> I've been I'm only on season nine I've watched every single episode through like a crazy person um but there are times when Amy's advice oh sorry so just to clarify she does a reading of the house without knowing anything about the family or the property and then he does like you know he goes and finds genealogists and goes to the library and like pulls out the actual you know information about the property and then they kind of compare notes at the end with the family and she gives advice uh to the family of like what to do next whether they need to like talk to a sh local shaman or like just leave the property altogether or you know, one child has an attachment and that's what's causing the issues. But what I wonder is when Amy's advice is you just need to leave. I'm mm. like, but what about the next people? Like, I know I, I don't understand how that works. Like, what would you do? Because you you can't just leave and like not sell the house. You know, you yeah. can't just like leave it abandoned. So do you tell like 
I don't know. I just always wondered about that because, like, there are times where she has said, this house is, this property, this land is cursed. You can't be here. No one can be here. It's just nothing good will happen on this land. And I'm like, well, so now who's going to buy it? Yeah, I feel like, just like how we were saying we should have, like, some sort of spiritual Avengers team. Yes. To, like, I feel like they definitely need one of, like, let's, you know, let's point you in a direction of, like, what to do after this, yeah, after that's we what leave. I wonder, right? Because I'm like, I feel like that's just creating trouble for now the whole you know, new family. You know who would fucking know? Cindy. Cindy. I swear to God, I need to talk to the Cindy person. She would at least know, because even if, like something was so haunted you didn't morally feel like you could sell it she probably yeah. would at least know a lawyer on like how to like you know get yourself off of having to deal with it sure you know? yeah or somebody who would want to buy it for that reason or something like yeah like there just need to be more zach bagans in the world who okay, the amazing apprentice all right you take no, that wait. back the amazing apprentice that was yeah we need the more office. of the amazing apprentice no not more zach bagans creston because oh, Crentist. <laughs> Crentist is the dentist in, in, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Oh my God, you're totally right. Scran okay. The amazing Crentist. <laughs> oh God. Okay, yeah, we need more Crestons to um to buy up those houses so we don't I have do, to worry I about agree. It. To like, just, you know, make the most of it. Because like, what if they move in and they have like an infant and it's like, yeah, well, yeah. You can't, oh, it's just such a bad idea. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, so, um, I have a story for you today that I'm very excited about. Uh, this is a story of Jared Fogel, a.k.a. the subway guy. Christine. Shut the fuck up. Because. So no, no, no. It. What? Shut, I'm saying shut the fuck up because. Does he have. Um, he has. A, I know there's a documentary. Was it on Discovery Plus? Did you just watch it? I was on your account and just watched it. So I think I put it on your queue by accident. No, I've been watching. I watched it like months ago. So you put it on my queue. I literally watched it two nights ago. I put <laughs> it on your queue? Wait. Because <laughs> I, 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 I forgot to, because I, I logged into your Discovery Plus account and then I forgot to switch it over to. To a different the, profile. So Yeah. So I was on your profile. Oh, I watched it a long, like, I mean, not a long time ago, but like at least a month or two ago. Well, it was there and I went, oh, I'm going to watch that. I'm sorry. Damn I'm it! so excited. No, Damn I'm so excited it! though because I can finally fucking contribute because I, I never know where things are going and <laughs> now I can talk about it. And wow. Stay off my honest, Discovery Plus. Honestly, I'm so glad like of all the um, topics that at least I'm warned ahead of time because talk about fucking graphic. Um, yeah, it's not good. I mean, Damn I, it. I was so excited for my plot twists. No, no, no. I'm glad. This is, this is going to work out just fine. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. It was going to be a good okay. time. I finally know how you feel when I'm like, I know about this. Um, no, um, uh, yeah. If anyone wants to watch that documentary, I'll tell you, if your stomach churns easy, maybe look out for like the later yeah, episodes. It's disturbing. But I mean, mm -hmm. I watch a lot of true crime. So that's I, true. I would, it was, I would, I would argue in the scheme of true crime, this is one I would recommend above many shows I watch. So. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, so yeah. I, I mean, I, I know it blows people's minds a lot, but I am part of a true crime podcast, which I'm very grateful for. But the whole thing is that Christine teaches me about this stuff. So I really stay off of like, I don't watch true crime shows. Until I don't watch true now. Crime. So um, I think I had some virgin eyes and watching that was really shocking to me. So the fact that you're just like, you know, oh, you're I like, oh, that's, kind of that's a... my every day. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was one that I've been just recommending to people because I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> maybe. I mean, I might just be kind of fucked up in that way of like, well, it's disturbing, but I mean, they're all disturbing. But yeah, I, it's all disturbing. I, but I never, I never sit down and watch anything true crime. So I was like captivated. So this well, is oh I'm, well, this is probably going to be now your your gateway drug. Now you're going to be logging into my discovery and stealing all my <laughs> inspiration. No, I'll be I'll be sneakier. You and know, do it on I my watched profile. that so that I could prepare this episode, and then you were like, "I'll watch it too." Oh man, wow. Okay. That's okay. This is good. You're right. You're going to, you're going to, this is going to be a new fun little way of doing this. So, okay. First of all, I listened to the red handed podcast episode about Jared Fogel. And if you tell me right now that you don't listen to podcasts, but you listen to this episode of red handed, I'm going to kill you. But I, I did not. 
UK. They, they uh, live in the UK, and they. It was so funny because they had to describe what Subway was. Like, oh my god, in their notes, and I was like, well, duh, you know, that's obviously like. Wait, how did they describe it? What they say? Oh, I don't know. Like, it's a fast food chain where people order sandwiches. Like, it was, it was just so trippy to hear like some it's... another country discuss like our food and have to explain it to each other and themselves. Huh. That's um, very um. And That's... I know there are subways internationally. I know that, but I think it's just not as no like this whole con- Jared and all this was, is not really an international thing. It's it's a U.S. thing. It's it's wild though because that feels like a culture shock to me that people would be shocked that there's a fast sandwich place. Well, I don't think it was like they were shocked. I think they just like had to explain what it was, and it was so weird for me as someone who has mm. basically always known what subway was to be like, oh yeah, I guess some people don't haven't heard mm. of subway gotcha gotcha you know what i mean like i, I don't think they funny. were weirded out by food i think it was just like it's just weird to hear people describe something that's you know so obvious to us it's the to hear the mechanics of something that feels so natural yeah, at this point. yeah yeah and subway feels so natural to me so i was like you know <laughs> <laughs> um we have gotten subway together on the road i don't know what we were thinking we were probably in a gas leak or something but oh christine um, you know what don't even with me because i think you're confusing it with i don't know what you were thinking because we <laughs> would go to subway yeah. i would get a normal and i said normal sandwich and then Christine, on the road at a gas station, would get the tuna fish, which no, has- No, we both got the tuna. Did we? Shit. Yes. And then Eva was like, I'll try it. And then we all got in the car and sat there and went, what have we done? Why did well, we do this on a show day in the middle of Texas? I think I so. I think I think was so ashamed that I removed myself, obviously, yes. from my own memory. Because but also, I was like, even I just discussed how we all realized we ordered tuna, like not one of us was safe. From if, a gas if station something, subway. If something was wrong from a gas station subway in the middle of nowhere, Texas. Well, I think, so I've also, since right around that time, I like started like, personally stopping eating the tuna there just because i've heard enough like of oh yeah I, we yeah we know it's knows? not real tuna all that don't worry i know and i ate it anyway okay i just i got scared because i didn't know what was in it and the mystery meat freaked me out so i was like nah not my thing anymore so now i'm like i'm sticking with turkey for a little bit but- i mean you're making probably the right choice i i just uh yeah, I sometimes get a really intense subway craving, and I'm like, why? I don't know why. It just happens. Some, sometimes it gets you. They have a, um, a rotisserie chicken option there that really can fuck you up in a good way. Um, but you know what? I like. How dare I say like, oh, I'm not going to eat the tuna at Subway, but like then I go to fucking Taco Bell and eat no whatever. No offense. Yeah, you were like, oh, it's just mystery <laughs> meat, and I'm like, well. <laughs> There's something about mystery fish that's worse in my mind, and I don't know why. I understand. But... I think I think most people had that reaction about the tuna, like, oh, then what is it? You know, um, mm-hmm. it's an yeah. alarming. It is alarming. You're not wrong. Um, and I can't cast aspersions because I know how sick it is. You know what I, <laughs> what I do. Uh, anyway, so let's get into this. So I heard the Red Handed podcast episode, and I was like, "Ooh, interesting topic." And then I listened, and they did like a two parter, maybe even a three parter. And this was before the docu series ever came out. Oh, and wow. I remember going, "Oh my god, this is so much worse than I thought. Like so much worse than I ever knew." Oh, so I only know about the documentary. So if there's any twists and turns outside of that, mm-hmm. I. I Not really. Know. I feel like then the documentary came out and I was like, oh, okay, now I can kind of put a face to everything and really like, and by the way, the, if you guys want to see it, I, I thought it was really good. Um, it's called Jared from Subway Catching a Monster on Discovery Plus. Uh, so, you know, if you want to check it out, I, I recommend it. I think it's good. Um, but I will say there there were things in the Red Handed podcast that did not make it into the docuseries, just like more detail basically about hmm. Um, the specifics of what he did so talk about stomach churning like that those episodes are deeply upsetting oh, um okay and definitely more in depth as far as like the detail of what went down and so i remember listening to that and going oh my god i had no idea how like they go into all, all his international escapades and all that which i don't think the Ooh, docuseries no. really touches i mean they touch on it but they don't like they let you know what happened, but yeah, they don't. They don't, I don't think they had room to like really, you know, break it down that far. Um, but so it was just a different angle. But I thought they did a really good job. So shout out to that show and then the docu series. Uh, here we go. I'm, I'm excited actually. Now I'm sorry that I got uh, flustered. I was just 
I think I got nervous. I like when you get flustered because it means in about five minutes you'll be really jazzed. So. You're totally right. You're like, you ruffled my feathers, so to speak. And then I was like, hell yeah. But I ruffled them like how you ruffle like a puppy dog in the ears, yeah. you know? And they get yeah. like all bent out of shape. But then, then they get wanna... the zoomies. They yeah. get the zoomies. Okay, we've nailed it. I got the zoomies. Here we go. Jared Fogel was born in Indianapolis, Indiana in 1977. And as he was growing up, he was pretty introverted. He spent most of his time playing video games indoors. Um, he spent a lot of his time eating as kind of a coping mechanism for feeling lonely. And he gained weight steadily throughout his childhood. And this just fed you know more isolation and made him feel you know more um just alone than than before well, also i don't i don't i like to pretend that kids are better today i hear that maybe they're not but um that was also like a time where like bullying people for like how they look was very okay like, i was gonna say i think this was definitely you know it's hard to say a different time and it's not an excuse but it is you're right an explanation of it was definitely more normalized mm -hmm. to bully people uh, and to be fat phobic it was just the way it is the way it was you know like there and was no one trying to like correct that later in life it was yeah, just yeah like... it was just like part of part of childhood and i think bullying even since we were young has taken on a whole new meaning nowadays oh, yeah. and i know that yes kids are still bullying is still a huge issue so we're not you know downplaying that um but it's definitely more i think more adults are concerned about it now than they may have been uh back then well because they probably it, got fucking bullied for it exactly. and now i know what it's like it's sort of like finally people are coming to realize like oh that's probably not normal and good for our mm -hmm. kids you know um and so yeah and 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 you know fat shaming was much more, yeah, still obviously an epidemic but you know it was it was considered just more normal i guess or more normalized and i know like even teachers were given a lot more freedom to be uh teasing or joking with their students and that kind of thing um even physical punishment all of that so it it was a different time so to speak um and so yeah he felt really isolated and so in 1998 uh he was a college student at indiana university and he felt like his weight was really getting in the way of him living a full life so he was 20 years old he weighed 425 pounds, and this made mobility really difficult for him. So it was difficult to walk more than a few steps. Uh, he was suffering from sleep apnea, which can, like, really harm your way of life and I know cause many issues down the road health-wise as well. Um, so he was exhausted. He was not getting good sleep. And so as a result, he started to fall asleep in class and fall behind. And it's mm. just that vicious cycle that, like, health can have, you know, bad mm. health can have on your life. Um, finally, the kind of the breaking point, the tipping point was when he fell asleep at the wheel of his car and he veered over a grass curb onto the sidewalk. And fortunately, nobody was injured, um, but it scared him badly enough that he was like, I need to make like a drastic change stat uh, if I want to, you know, live yeah. a long and happy life. So on his own, uh, without, you know, consulting a professional or, or anything, which I definitely don't recommend to anybody, um, Jared decided to go on kind of a weight loss journey. And so the way he did this was that he cut his calories drastically. He kind of cold turkeyed it, so to speak, and began eating only 20% of the calories that he had been eating previously. Wow. Which that's... is like a massive cut and it is not good for you typically. Like that's Yeah, I feel like in, if he did that in today's world where like, you know, people I don't know, I feel like in I like to think in today's world it would be different, but maybe not. But I feel I like don't if... know. have you seen those juice cleanses? That's basically that wrapped up in a really expensive fucking That's a good point. I, I I'd like to think someone would be like, Hey, why are we especially like since Subway ended up sponsoring him, it would's like I wonder in today's world if they would want to brag about like, hey, someone did like a really like unhealthy well, thing. <laughs> I don't think that they framed it that way. It's like a juice cleanse. They're like, oh, well, look at how many veggies you're eating and you're cleansing your body. You know, I think yeah. it's just it's the That's same. True. It's just a different packaging of like a crash diet. You know, I mean, it, good point. It, it good was point. a crash diet. And to be fair, like the amount he was eating in a day wasn't like three grains of rice like it was 20 percent of what he had been eating when he was at his heaviest so it was still you know it was a massive cut not very dangerous it's a crash diet but you know it's still it wasn't like 
like he was still eating multiple meals a day. So it didn't look on the outside like as probably drastic as it seemed. Um, but so for whatever reason, his body handled this dramatic change uh just fine um he lost more than half his body weight in one year which is just shocking oh and, yeah talk, talk about a crash diet um and so people obviously noticed this this is really jarring and so his campus newspaper asked to feature him in a story about his weight loss and that is when jared revealed his secret and you know americans love a good secret to weight loss <laughs> so all everybody secret. all everybody wants i've been there uh, it's really tough out there man everyone's got a secret so this is his secret every single day he would eat the same thing he would have a six inch turkey sub from subway for lunch and for dinner he would get a foot-long veggie delight sub he also ate a small bag of potato chips and a diet pop and on his sandwiches, he would keep mayo, oil, and cheese off his sandwiches. Oh. This is his meal every single day. And that is how he cut his calories, and that is how he lost half his body weight. So when they asked why Subway, he said, well, it was right next door, and it was easy to access. Uh, okay, good enough, I guess. Sure. Uh, he said he craved pizza and other fast food, but he forced himself to stick to his plan, and that is how he had lost all this weight. So... Next thing you know, Men's Health magazine picks up this article and they feature Jared in a segment called Weird Diets That Actually Work. And when they published that, Jared's story took off majorly. He ended up on the news and then ding dong, Subway's calling. They mm -hmm. have found this story and they are very excited. <laughs> I'm sure, especially like, can you imagine if you're looking for a new angle and someone just literally just, just says how about this on yeah. a silver fucking platter and that's what yep. he did it was 1999 and he filmed his first commercial for subway which aired january 1st 2000 so let's think about new century day one weight loss i bet that i bet the gym ads and diet ads on the first of january 2000 were like mm -hmm. at a peak you have oh, to yeah. imagine like oh if we survive y2k into the new millennium oh yeah okay i mean can you mm. imagine the uh uh because they always say like oh if you're gonna go to the gym like january and february are the worst because that's when Terrible everyone's doing time. their resolutions yep. and then like eventually they taper off imagine when people thought that like the world was truly gonna end and they were like if i if i make it all i promise i'll do this if i make it I'll oh do that. Like, my god the resolution you're right it's like you're bargaining oh the I resolutions of, of the turn of the millennia is just i can't imagine how many people were like in right, the gym on you, january 1st yeah because you wake up and you're like well i'm still here i guess i have to 50 more years to live Might i guess well i have to go to the gym, gym like i like i promised i would yeah that's a great point. I hadn't even thought of it that way. But yeah, so he basically started off the new millennium hot uh, with a Subway ad uh, that aired the first of the year. So the commercial's goal was to rebrand Subway as a healthy fast food, well, the healthy fast food option for Americans. And it oh. fucking worked. Of course. It did. It yeah. did. I, I grew up thinking Subway was healthy. I did not because my mom is crazy and was like, well, maybe not. <laughs> no, well, okay. Okay. Great. Great point. But it was sort of anything where I was like, oh, that's healthy or, or that's X, Y, Z. She'd be like, no, it's not. <laughs> I'd be like, okay. Well, I mean, compared to McDonald's and Burger King, I mean, it's kind of very, you can quickly kind of go to like, oh, well, this place has like deli meats and produce. So like, no, you're totally right. And uh, yeah, exactly. Compared to like a Taco Bell, you know, Crunchwrap yeah. Supreme. Sure. Yes. You're totally, totally right. Um, and I think, and to be fair, like we ate Subway way more than any other fast food growing up. So my mom probably also believed that. Um, I ate it all the time. Like us, like if you were, um, like on a sports team or something, you would always like, if somehow it would yes. end up at games or on buses or for lunch at school sometimes. Yeah. Yes. And I remember, um, we would go. So even when I was on, I guess we can discuss this because, uh, it's sort of topical to the story, but. Um, when I was on Weight Watchers, which is now WW, very toxic, you know, folks, mm -hmm. just be careful out there. Um, when I was on Weight Watchers, I would go eat the ve a six inch veggie delight with no cheese. And it's like basically just whole grain bread, whole wheat bread with like a bunch of like mediocre lettuce and tomatoes and like 
vinaigrette on it and I would just eat that and be like yum I'm eating (laughs) fast food and it was like six points of my like allotted eight points of the day or something insane you might as well just like like, eat a bag of carrots I know it was like really sad and it was like oh look I can log my six inch veggie delight with no it just is sad to think about but it is uh it was still prevalent and that was after that was when I was in college so you know that tells you something that was after all of this scandal went down and I was still just looking at it as a healthy fast food option so you know, it, that tells really, you something. I mean, even their like chip options, they try to always have like the baked but chips that's, and And that's I think I misspoke. That was what he ate. A baked chip. Ugh, they suck. Sorry. But like, I, I really just like I think they're fine, but I I'm I they're not as good as regular chips. <laughs> I think that's why, because I'm sure they don't suck, but they're not amazing. They're right. not a, they're not a just burrito. Am, I'm, I'm always like, that's not worth it. I'd rather just eat a regular bag of chips or not eat chips. I don't know. Anyway, okay, so he was suddenly skyrocketed to superstardom in the sense of, in in like corporate America's sense of the word. So basically, he was like the Geico gecko. I don't know. I don't know another (laughs) flow from progressive, like somebody where everybody just kind of knows who that is. I mean, we also, we grew up in the time where we unfortunately were his, you know, his victim demographic mm-hmm. and he he without giving too much away he becomes very active in like children's organizations and stuff like that but i mean the whole thing was like they promoted to kids like look at jared the subway guy he's gonna like lead oh, you to healthy there. eating don't you worry and i remember like i remember his face so well as a kid being like jared the subway guy made subway healthy jared the subway guy yeah. tells me i can have fast food and not feel bad about it jared the subway guy and it, like i remember his cardboard poster everywhere i remember everywhere. every commercial every commercial he was in all the posters like we were very do you um, know how many years he of was on the market TV? like at Doing least these... a decade at least 15 years of this yeah i remember him so well and i feel like usually when you tell stories about like this guy was an icon i wouldn't fucking know jared the subway guy isn't I that know. wild and, you know, I wonder because, like, I feel like my sister, I'm just wondering, like, if I had asked her, she'd be like, oh, yeah, he's familiar. But I don't think it was it would be as prominent because we were that exact age where that we were like preteens. This came out. It was like it was just a huge deal. And also noting that at the time that we were that age, we couldn't just skip commercials like commercials were on. Yeah, you had constantly. to watch them. We had to watch them. And so if it was like on TV but it was also like through it he was part of he like started some organization they i remember they did like promos and like nickelodeon and disney Mm -hmm. so like it was fully targeted at children again at a time when you had to watch the commercials i mean everyone knew jared the subway guy everyone yes yes um and we're not trying to gaslight you if you're like who's jared (laughs) allison if you're listening my poor girlfriend my my poor girlfriend she's like always the last on pop culture so i I, but i bet she she wouldn't even seem to mind to be honest let me text let me text her i'll i'll give you an answer at some point in the show well i think she'll know i think she'll know we had we had a sub she had to witness me eating my six point veggie delight sandwich so i think let's see you never know who who is the subway guy that's what i said she's gonna google it i said do you know jared the subway guy oh okay okay anyway so anyway he becomes this like sensation uh people are suddenly totally on board not just for the subs mostly for jared himself uh overnight he became a beloved celebrity he was on oprah he was on all the talk shows he was doing circuits he was doing ads for all these different commercials it was crazy and it was this like bizarre phenomenon because usually people don't just become famous from being in an ad you know but for eating sandwiches that's my dream are you kidding me like i know and to clarify also like he does he's not like super hot or like it's not like oh you would see this guy he's a dude he's just your average joe and i think that was why this worked so well is like everyone was was like Oh, I can relate to that. I could yeah. be that guy. I could lose 200 pounds. And so it just seemed to really hit America in that right spot somehow. Um, it was like a story people aspired to. And, you know, at first, for obvious reasons, Jared was like, well, 
these are my 15 minutes of fame. Um, I'm sure they won't last. But as we know, his momentum did not slow down. He signed a contract with Subway for an annual $1 million salary in exchange for ads and public appearances. Damn. And over, I know, like immediately getting a million dollars a year just for that. Over the next 15 years, he would do 300 ads for Subway. And these, I mean, also they show them in the docuseries, but like he was having like, doing commercials with like famous athletes like oh yeah the nfl like the i remember NFL. seeing like football players with them and he would like throw a subway with them like it was yes like, and it was so cheesy but people like ate it up because it was just i don't I, know why but it i worked. ate it up i yeah. ate it up <laughs> yeah me I think too it, i think it really was just because like we all knew him as like like you're saying, like he was so human to us and he just like kind of stumbled onto t- onto the television. Yes. You know what? That's also part of it. And um, remember American Idol came out right around this time and mm. people just loved the concept of like the girl next door, the every guy. You could be this instant celebrity. You could just be plucked from a diner like Kelly Clarkson and suddenly like skyrocketed to fame. Like for whatever reason in the early 2000s, we were like so obsessed with that concept. It's, it was very wild. The turn of uh, like the early 2000s really was a time where before that nobody processed like anybody could be someone like yes it like didn't even occur. And then all of a sudden, like, like even like high school musical was like, you can be a basketball player and sing yes. like didn't like blew people's fucking minds whoa that's so true and also i feel like we were of the generation where our parents generation was saying to us you can be anything you put your mind to you can be the president you can be yeah a rock star you can be like the next i don't know famous yeah math guy i have no you could literally eat a fucking sandwich enough times and then end up like throwing a football with a nfl player yes like it felt like you're totally right and like even the sweepstakes at the time remember we're always on cereal boxes like you could be flown to hawaii and meet tony the tiger and be featured in a commercial and people were like i want that like yeah I don't know what the psychology is there, but we were obsessed with it. And I guess now with people going viral and stuff, it's, oh, it's kind so of much... the same, but I mean, hello, TikTok. Like, I mean, to exactly. go from the early 2000s of like shocked that anyone could like right. make it to like people make it every fucking day now. Like, yeah, it's such a weird turnaround of like now we just assume anybody can be famous. <laughs> yeah. It's like yeah. wild thought. So, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to go on a tangent, but. That was the best way to put it. Like people were just so enthralled with this idea. Like you could just be suddenly skyrocketed to fame and like it happened. And so just to give you an idea of like how successful this was in 2013, uh, Subway's chief marketing officer credit Jared with up to one half of the entire corporation's growth in that Holy time. Holy shit. Like, which like massive. Which by the way, like that. Going back to what you just said too about like how at the time people didn't didn't couldn't understand that anyone could just make it like this. I I think the only reason that he had profits like that or stats like that is because at the time that was so rare. I think today, right. if someone lost a bunch of weight eating Subway, like best they would get is like Subway would like collab with them on a TikTok. Like, and I think, yes, I was gonna say it would be like a blip on the social media radar you'd be like oh did you hear that one guy like did you see that one viral video mm-hmm. that's so i feel like maybe and now if you it's were like... sick and we're sleeping through it and you woke up next week you've missed the whole thing it's too late <laughs> and also if you posted at the wrong time no one would even fucking see yes. it so like i i think maybe it was a bigger deal then because there was no such thing as oversaturation like that's there a wasn't great point there wasn't internet there wasn't and again because we didn't have a choice we just had to watch what was in front of us so it wasn't like we could change channel or you could change a channel but you couldn't like just skip anything you wanted or avoid there wasn't anything an algorithm like a lot of people i mean like i had direct tv so i was privileged Whoa, but there were, lucky but there were, duck there were some people where like you only had so many channels like what was there some people yeah me either, <laughs> i had pbs kids well either you watched it or you didn't fucking watch it either you were in the note or you weren't and like there was no like you know swipe for a half an hour and find a hundred different people getting famous right now like it was yeah it's it, just beyond it's out of control like it feels so dif- distant and different um and i'm sure a lot of you listening are like oh yep been there uh <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's probably very familiar 
So just to give you an idea, in Jared's first year with Subway, Subway's profits grew 18% just in that one Ooh. year. Oh my God. Then the following year, an additional 16%. So just to recap, 34% profit increase by bringing Fogel, Jared Fogel into their branding in the first two years. Yes. I also wonder if that was because, like we just said, this was the this was the 2000 mm. Y2K resolution where everyone was really dead set on losing weight. But the and only reason they said they were healthy is because they brought him on. Like they had never branded us up before. So like he... He I wonder was the if, only reason they so you mean like a combo of like him coming was, on board and the 2000s oh for sure I think I, it was I think the, it was the timing yeah I think it was a perfect storm that like all of a sudden like a bunch of people probably more than usual even if by like one percent all these people now want to lose weight because they have this big resolution and then this one guy shows up and is like well you don't have to do anything but eat sandwiches from Subway exactly yeah Exactly. I think it was a combo of the two. So 34% profit increase uh, in the first two years, which is just outrageous. Um, So America just fucking fell in love with this guy. And Jared's ads usually featured what they called, this is the official name of them, his famous fat pants. It's genuinely the name of them. Uh, He would hold them up to show how big he used to be. And I think the cardboard cutout had that as well. Yep. Uh, There were cardboard cutouts of his pants and you could like stand in them. Stand behind them. Oh, yeah. That was a big photo op. (laughs) Outrageous. So they would obviously compare, you know, his current size to the pants. And that was the big thing, the big shtick. And, you know. Jared was marketed as this inspiration to aspire to, but really he felt just a lot of shame about, you know, his his weight previously. And when describing his fat pants, he he said, it's a good reminder for me, obviously. You know, people are always fascinated to see the pants. It's a great visual aid, especially when I'm talking to kids, you know, to have a good message for them about the mistakes that I made. So, like, he, you know, it's Ugh. it's really fat phobic, obviously, very, very f- shame filled rhetoric yeah. and you know like oh well i made all these mistakes and, and children should wrong and bad. make yeah. these mistakes and it's just very already kind of fucked up um but people were eating this up so to speak and jared ended up founding a charity called the jared foundation love that for him the jared foundation i guess you kind of have to go with that because everyone no one knows, knows you. you by any other <laughs> name yeah but the jared Except foundation subway guy or fat pants yeah. right yeah you're right i guess out of the three options this is the least bad um and so what he would do the goal of this organization was to combat childhood obesity in the united states and so he would travel to schools with his fat pants quote unquote to teach children how important it is to eat healthy and this foundation ultimately became uh not really helpful to anybody, more just a tax write-off scheme for Jared. He actually pledged over $2 million in grants to combat childhood obesity. And in the end, the charity only gave out $100,000. Oh, okay. And he had pledged $2 million. Wow. Does, that, does Allison know who the subway guy is? I just saw uh, something come through and it was not her, so. Oh, bummer. Oh, well. So, uh... People, like we said, thought of him as like the everyman. If he could do it, so can I. And, you know, he had this average Joe look. Uh, He would even he was even considered like inspiring and dedicated because after his talks at different schools, he would stay. He would answer questions. He would uh, hang out with the kids, play ball, chat with them, answer any questions they had, take photos and you know, throughout this, of course, he's he's doing like circuits of the United States and he's meeting all these different people. And in 2001, he married his first wife, whose name was Elizabeth Christie, and they eventually divorced in 2007 when Elizabeth reportedly fled and filed a restraining order against Jared. Um, and all we know about that is that Elizabeth's friends told the media that Jared had a mean streak, quote unquote, which hey. is a scary and alarming red flag. And I i'm unfortunately we don't know they didn't talk about about, they didn't talk about that in the documentary okay i was gonna say i'm not sure what of this is from where as far as like a lot of it is just from my head not the stats but you know like some of the stories and stuff so i don't know what's from the docuseries what's from the podcast i mean i i do also wonder like was it because of his skyrocket to fame or going from like a quote loser to like all of a sudden well, no have... that's he oh oh you mean that he because he met her like several years into this 
Yeah, I'm saying like I wonder if like where his anger issues started. Oh, I from. see, I see. I like, see. was it because he's like now a diva, or is it like was he always this way? Or I don't right, know. right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Like, is he now finally acting out his his mean streak he's always had? Who knows? But either way, all we know is that he apparently had quote a mean streak, and his first wife fled. Um, so you know, not many people talked about this, and Jared just continued to bask in his success. One day while traveling for work, uh, Jared was struggling to write up a speech he had uh, he had to give the following day. And he met this man named Russell Taylor, who worked as the youth market director for the American Heart Association. And Jared was like, oh, perfect. Somebody who can help me with this speech. So he asked for help writing this last minute keynote and Russell wrote it and it turned into the smash hit. And Jared was like, I need you to work with me, you know, from now on, come join me, join the Jared foundation. And from then on, Jared and Russell worked together on events and eventually Russell became the director of the Jared foundation. So as M knows, and if you've watched this docuseries, you know, they had a really weird relationship. (laughs) I don't, I don't, again, remember how much of this they talked about on uh, the actual show, but they had a really weird relationship. They traveled together constantly, and according to Russell, Jared required him to drink heavily. Uh, He spent thousands of dollars on wine just to, like, basically pressure Russell into drinking a lot as part of the job Mm -hmm. uh jared would rent hotel rooms for them to share when they traveled and one night this is kind of uh the start of the downhill in this relationship he took russell to a strip club and after spending thousands of dollars on dancers he told russell he would pay him to convince a dancer to come back to their hotel for sex so russell worked it out with one of the dancers and they both paid her for sex that night And from then on, the two consistently engaged in sexual activities with other people, but like together. Yeah. It sounds like he was into watching or something. Yeah. Yeah. He had some proclivities and um, Mm -hmm. it seems that that was one of them. Well, he seems to, it sounds like he liked either watching or being watched and. Yeah, there was definitely an element of that. So that's probably exactly nail on the head of why he would force him to share a hotel room. Mm -hmm. Um, And so Jared was just strange in general. Like, it sounds like of all people to rocket to fame, um, this is not a good one because he took his power and money and influence and just like fucking ran with it. And suddenly all the shit that was probably buried in his subconscious just came tunneling forward and basically okay uh, i'm not gonna get ahead of myself let's just let's get back to the notes christina okay so jared was a seriously strange man in general okay he liked to hold power over people he would make really weird demands of russell um like forcing him to eat gluten even though he had a really severe gluten allergy Mm. and like or gluten intolerance and it made him so sick but Jared just forced him to eat it, which is, like, dis- bizarre. I don't know if this is, like, a psychology thing, but I'm getting a vibe that it feels like maybe he just felt like... Um, no, this isn't justifying it. I'm trying to, like, analyze. that. I feel like he's maybe, like, he never got to be in control or, like, be seen as, like, gross, the alpha before, because he was always, like, quote, the loser. So maybe mm-hmm. he's, like, really into, like, this dominance thing or yeah, something. Yeah, ew. Like, okay. having, finally having power. And, I like, f- I mean, forcing a grown man to, like, hurt eat himself? a food that hurts his tummy. <laughs> like, what a weird thing to be, like, so aggressive about. Yeah. But, yeah, it was just, like, a very, very toxic situation. Um, Jared also would call himself daddy when he spoke to Russell. (laughs) So like, there's clearly a power dynamic there of like, this is what I consider myself around you. Like you have to do what I say, just very weird. And at this point, Jared started making jokes and dropping hints about, here we go. If you haven't caught on yet, here's the big gross twist. It, the what? The aha moment. The aha moment. Uh, he starts making jokes and dropping hints about being attracted to children. And Russell would just kind of laugh it off at first, even though he knew Jared was serious about this. Uh, and then Jared took it further and started getting Russell to find him child pornography on the Internet. Oh, yeah. And whenever the pair would hire sex workers from then on, Jared were, would offer the women that they hired even more money to find him 
children who had been forced into sex work. And Jared would tell them, the younger, the better. Okay. So the pair then took the Jared Foundation International. And I kind of alluded to this, but basically he told people, his, I don't know, investors, that it was time to fight childhood obesity on a global scale. So they went straight to Southeast Asia, uh, countries like Thailand, Indonesia, and immediately began participating in exploitative sex tourism, where they would go and pay sex workers premiums to find them victims of child sex trafficking and would just openly engage in this and uh, discuss it with one another. And it just became their their norm when traveling. Um, but of course, as we've also alluded to, Jared had access to children in the U.S. as well because he had mm -hmm. a little something called the Jared Foundation aimed his, at as fighting sorry. childhood obesity. And so his whole thing, his whole premise was I'm going to elementary schools, middle schools and teaching kids about how to be healthy and playing basketball with them and answering their questions and giving them hugs and letting them stand in my pants and taking photographs together. Well, as you were saying sick. earlier is that he would stay later too. And exactly. you know, he was, he was like I'm so dedicated and engaged with the children. And I'm sure he was, he would call it for some reason, like networking or connecting with a, a client. He could yep. come up with whatever he wanted. And yeah, it was he's just like working overtime to make sure that he's saving all these children from the mistakes he made. It's so mm -hmm. sickening. And he just, of course, of all people, it's like devil in disguise. Like he's just there. Also, again, helping children, quote unquote. Again, like he's just like an average joe so like no he's unassuming in both ways no yes. one thought he'd be famous and no one thought he'd be dangerous exactly exactly he looked just so average and i think nowadays we'd be maybe a little more heightened awareness i like to think but who knows i mean people get by all the time without getting caught for things so he of course began victimizing children that he met through the jared foundation russell taylor his cohort had recently married a woman named Angie Taylor and uh, Angie Taylor now goes by Angie Baldwin uh, and she had two daughters. So these daughters um, were interviewed on the docu-series. Um, they're, I just found them very, I don't know, engaging to watch. They were very, uh, what's the word? Just well-spoken. They were just mm -hmm. like very um, great at being interviewed. So at the time, Hannah was 10 and Christian was 13 when their mom met Russell, their new stepdad. So they moved into a beautiful home with Russell and things seemed great at first. Uh, did you know, I don't know if they talked about this, Jared actually owned Russell's house. And oh, no, I didn't know that. would like use it as leverage, of course, against Russell to like you know, get him to do what he wanted. Well, I also um, feel like if you're making him get really, really drunk, like I feel like he's doing a lot of shameful things you're later holding over his head. Right, so. exactly. He did, Right. He has a lot. Of... Well, like what's shameful when you're already R-wording children, you know? Right. Like... Well, that's different. <laughs> but, uh, God, okay. I know. So Hannah and Christian said in an interview that their childhood looked idyllic from the outside. According to Hannah, it looks like we were all doing well. We were going on vacations. We were moving up in the world. But all of that was a facade because our lives really started to take a turn for the worse. So at first they thought Russell was pretty cool. This is their new stepdad. He's moving them into a really cool house. He worked with the subway guy. And, you know, they're that exact age where all their friends are like, oh, my God, you know, Jared, the subway guy. And they're like, yeah. I, I totally would have. I mean, we were also that demographic. I would have been like, absolutely. Wow. You know, a celebrity, him. you know, yeah. and. And they're in Indiana. So it's like how many, you know, local celebrities are around. And so they, they thought like this is pretty cool. We're getting like social points and, you know, he's making good money. We have this beautiful home. And this is pretty quickly going to become a nightmare for them because their mom, Angie, and their stepdad, Russell, uh, start grooming them to ease them into let's call it an all adult world so apparently their family motto was age is just a number as long as you're mature enough to do it you're gonna do it i cool? want to vomit that's, that's okay. fucking sick for it's sick so their mom and stepdad would host parties where they encouraged the girls to drink and do drugs i mean these kids are like preteens, like they're in middle school they're very young it's very disturbing russell would 
constantly teased the girls for being virgins as children. He wanna... told them Ugh. it's sick. He told them at their age they should be exploring more. I mean, they're just fully grooming these children. <laughs> In the meantime, Jared became more of a looming presence in their lives. He would make sexual remarks about them. He would make inappropriate comments about their friends, some of whom were as young as eight years old. He would look at photos of their friends and rate them all by who he thought was the most attractive and, like, ask them to send more photos of their friends. But he also, and at one point, I think it, they said in the documentary, too, that, like, when you were saying the stepdad was, um, like picking on them for being virgins he like started like leaving like sex toys in their room for them with like um yes he started leaving a note that was saying like like notes saying like have fun or some horrid horrid something yeah he would leave like uh vibrators in their room and write notes that said things like uh you should try this out and then when they would be like what the hell he'd be like it's just a joke ha 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 and their mom was like, just uh, whatever, you know, it just was like so grotesque. Like, I mean, Ugh. yes, yes. Also, yeah. I'm sorry for speaking over you so much. I just never get to contribute. No, so. I love it because honestly, that that I'm glad you mentioned that because it'll come back, but I'm, it definitely fits here better. Um, okay. And and so, yeah, they were getting like fully groomed into this. They, of course, as children, they're like, what the fuck is going on? Like, they don't know what's happening. Um, and they're being like pressured to drink and do drugs and, you know, under their own roof. It's all very, very toxic and abusive. So in late 2013, uh, captain of the Indiana State Police, Chuck Cohen, got a call from a state trooper who whose friend had concerns that someone they knew was distributing bestiality porn and that someone's name was Russell Taylor. So at the time, possessing images and videos depic depicting bestiality was actually not a crime, only the act of bestiality was. So investigators kind of looked into this and they saw that the messages, uh, you know, had been sent from Russell Taylor and it was a woman performing sexual acts with a horse. And so they took this uh, to get a warrant to search the Taylor's home. And that's where they found images of his wife, Angie, engaged in sexual acts with animals. <gasps> and they thought, like, wow, this is pretty bad. But little did they realize it would get far worse than that. Because they also, as they're going through the house, discover hidden cameras built into different facets of the home clocks uh you know other things just places where you wouldn't uh know they were there and so of course russell's like oh it's for safety to prevent theft which is like super weird considering the cameras were pointing at his stepdaughter's beds oh that's a rough that's a rough explanation he's gonna have to put together <laughs> yep uh, precisely precisely and this is where i was gonna mention um he would leave sex toys on their beds and when oh, we think okay. Oh, there were cameras pointing at their beds. You could kind of conclude what's happening here. Um, mm. He had cameras. Uh, investigators described the places where cameras were located as places that were intimate for children, such as beds, showers, and any space where they might be undressing. So, I mean, talk about absolutely violating just like to find this out. And ultimately, investigators did find a video produced of clips from all of these different cameras uh, put together mm. of children involved in sex acts, uh, children just undressed, changing clothes, just a big back-to-back -back, like montage of this. And so investigators, this is just horrific to hear Christian and Hannah explain, they were brought in to identify not only themselves, but their friends in these videos. So Police basically brought them in. They didn't know what was going to happen. And then they pull out these videos and are like, who's this person? Oh, it's my best friend wearing no clothes. You know, it's just like so <sighs> violating, so horrific. Um, and if you know, and I'm assuming this eventually got into the hands of Jared. Is that where we're going with this? Uh, Not yet. Okay. Okay. So this is like the the point where the kids are kind of putting it together like oh okay it's starting to click why our stepdad is such a creeper why our friends are so uncomfortable around him and our house this is what he's been doing this whole time um they you know the police blurred out 
their bodies in the videos, but they had to identify the faces of all these different victims who were themselves and their friends. And at first, uh, one of the girls said she was frozen because she couldn't believe what was happening to her. And then she remembered, I think I was starting to reconcile what was really going on. Everything that ever happened with Russell finally made sense. Mm. So Russell Taylor at this point was arrested and immediately Jared and the Subway Corporation released statements. And Jared's statement read, I was shocked to learn of the disturbing allegations against Mr. Taylor. Effective immediately, the Jared Foundation has severed all ties with Mr. Taylor. So basically, yes. Covered his own ass. <laughs> exactly. And you were totally right. Like, Jared was a big part of this grotesque, you know, operation that Russell and Angie were you know, enacting it under their own roof. Like he, Jared was instigating and perpetuating and getting the content from them. As well, so far yeah. as like, well, cause you said earlier, cause I, I don't remember this part from the, the documentary. You said that he was like paying him to collect child pornography for him. So yes. was that, that was what this was, was like a home project to then give it to him yes he was funneling okay. this back to jared and you know since he was also part of this whole s underage operation as far as like going abroad and also engaging with children minors you know he was also part of this but ultimately yes the this was being sent then to jared for okay his consumption it's just sickening um it was like you know jared had access to these children was like okay i'll exploit that and their stepdad is totally 110% on board. Great. And then he gets caught and Jared's like, that's sick. You know. So Subway was like, oh, God, I cannot believe this has happened. They had, they said they had no affiliation. Uh, they were disgusted by these claims. They were so glad Jared had taken such swift action. And then they were like, phew, glad we dodged that bullet. And um, once again, they had no idea what they were getting into. Mm-hmm. Because pretty soon the other shoe dropped, and that's when investigators were going through Russell's correspondence while building his case, and they found that Russell had texted an explicit image of a child to da -da -da -da, his boss, Jared Fogle, and they were like, uh-oh, he's part of this. Mm -hmm. So it turns out Jared actually, this is very fucked up, knew this child personally through mm. the Jared Foundation, and so... You know, they could very easily link this directly back to Jared. And Jared had received this picture in the text and replied enthusiastically. And thankfully, that's all the information I have on that. Uh, Russell told police that he was only committing some of his crimes to meet Jared's demands, which is like not a good like, yes, I believe that. But I don't think that that's an excuse at all. Not as helpful as he thought it was. Right. Exactly. It's like, yeah, I we only, know. I only half mean it. <laughs> yeah he's like well i did like i did it for for that it doesn't matter fucking a so on july 7 2015 investigators raided jared's home and you know they tried to avoid media attention the the people leading the investigation didn't even tell the officers whose house this was because they wanted to keep this under wraps yeah but of course the media found out even though they went super early in the morning the media found out people gathered in the street. I mean, full like helicopters, vans, full circus situation. And there are videos of them carrying out just stuff from his house. They removed 5.6 terabytes of information stored on thumb drives, computers, multiple phones. And the nation is shocked. But they're kind of like, I don't think he would do that. What? <laughs> public opinion is like jared wouldn't do that in today's world QAnon would be like it was planted but, oh no yes q oh i thought you so you said QAnon for some reason i was thinking anonymous and i was like i don't think they would oh, say that no okay, An okay. anonymous q would absolutely help us like, get this anonymous guy <laughs> is the one who found it okay got you yes uh q -Anon would be like hillary did it it's the emails yeah. you know <laughs> Um, my nurse said that to me the other day. I was like, <gasps> I can't do this right now. I was like, you just put a needle in my arm. I'm vulnerable to you right yeah, now. Please exactly. don't tell me more about Hillary. Oh so my God. anyway, the nation was shocked. People were on Jared's side. A lot of people, one investigator said in the public's eye, people were still siding with Jared and believing he had been duped. And like, I mean, to be fair, they had Russell Taylor to point at. They could be like, oh, it was that creepy guy he worked with, you know, yeah. not him. 
So one journalist even said when the story broke, she didn't believe it because Jared Fogel was considered one of the most trusted people in the country. That's so alarming. Well, also on top of it, like think of all of the parents that would have to reconcile with the fact that they left their kid with him, which is like, I know that's not at all how they should think about it, but but they would, they would have to, they would have to, there's got to be a a bit of like mob mentality denial of like, but I would have been able to spot that. And my kid, exactly. I want my kid to be safe. I didn't feel my nobody kid. wants to feel like they've been duped or tricked by somebody they trusted or and especially the let their children trust. Yeah. So y- exactly. People wanted to be in denial of this and they were. And so as Jared's house was raided on national television, a woman named Rochelle Herman, who is the main character pretty much of the docuseries, calls into her local Florida news station, ABC seven and says, I have something to say. Mm hmm. Now, Rochelle had met Jared Fogel years earlier when she worked as a radio station host and had interviewed him. And this is from an article on investigationdiscovery.com, just to give you an idea. So this article said, Herman got her first disturbing glimpse into Fogel's mind as they shot the interview at a middle school. According to the journalist, Fogel whispered into her ear at one point, quote, Jared leaned over just out of the blue and tells me how hot he thought middle school girls were. Like the boldness. You don't even know this fucking Shocking. person. To, like it's not like it's this is Russell Taylor where you have like built some weird connection. Like, like rapport. To go up to a stranger, like that that's the level of like the narcissist cockiness yes. that I think must have come from fame because he really thought he was untouchable enough untouchable. that touchable. With all of the how quickly he could have gotten fired, but he thought there's no way I'll ever get fired. I can go up to a stranger and say, I like middle school children and nothing will happen. And nothing will happen. And he did that. And she recalls, I just shut down. It was such a shock to me. She was so shocked. Like she basically her reaction was, I know I need to do something. I can't just let this sit here. But she knew no one was just going to believe her or say like, oh, you must have misheard. So her plan was, which has gotten a lot of controversy over the years it was to start a relationship with jared and ultimately try and basically go undercover and try to get the proof she needed to go to authorities Mm -hmm. so according to rochelle i knew i needed to get jared on tape in his own words his own voice expressing his desires his confessions and especially even his plans for children she explains it wasn't the most thought out plan but once the evidence was acquired i could hand it over to the authorities So Rochelle claims she maintained their relationship to gather evidence. And to her credit, she does have now infamous recordings of Jared discussing very dark shit about children. And they play these in the docuseries as well. They're deeply disturbing. Um, Rochelle submitted these recordings to the FBI, but they were like, well, it's not enough evidence. He's just talking about it. You know what I mean? Like he's just saying stuff that's Mm -hmm. in his head. It's not proof that he really did anything. So in May 2013, which was two years before Jared's home would would be raided, Rochelle went to local police in Sarasota and was like, the FBI is not doing anything. I gave them this information and he, this guy's still running around out there. And she showed them the recordings. And of course, they were disgusted, but they were like, this guy lives in a totally different state. We have no jurisdiction. We're sorry. If the FBI has this, that's like all we can do. So Rochelle told them if the FBI failed to act for much longer, she would go to the news herself. And it wasn't much long after that that the FBI showed up at the radio station and confiscated all of the evidence she had collected against Jared. So she basically Mm. had no recourse. So they raided her home as well, and they told her to stay quiet or she would be charged with impeding an ongoing investigation. So now she is just in the worst possible spot because... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I was just going to say she knows all these things. There's just nothing she can do. Well, also, and the, the first time she went to the police, I think they also forced her to continue going undercover because I think she yes. was she was so fed up with having to hear all these like she didn't want to do it anymore. She was like, this is where I've left it. And then they said, well, under this law, you have to You're get totally permission. Right. You have to get permission to record somebody. And since you didn't do that, you technically came to us and admitted you broke the law. So if you want to stay out of getting arrested, you are now going to be an undercover informant for us and you have to keep this up. I cannot believe I forgot that. They basically coerced her into being their undercover pawn 
And then just to do nothing with the recordings until she threatened to leak them. And then they stole them and then still seemingly did nothing for a while. Yes. And there were times where she said she had to leave her children at home alone because the FBI were like, you need to bring this to us right now. And she's and like, be like, children have nobody. Yeah. Have nobody to watch them. And they were like, we don't care. You know? And so she was put in this horrible position. And to be fair, yes, she was like, I'll do this cool undercover thing, which like probably not the wisest. But I, I mean, I think she did have... I think she had good intentions. It's hard to know. But, you know, I mean, I see where she was coming from. Uh, It's a little harebrained, something I would do, bulldozer, you know. I I get it, but it did not work out well for her, ultimately. Um, So she basically just had to sit there and watch Jared thrive on television, all while she knew everything about him but knew no one would believe her. Mm -hmm. And this whole thing was so stressful that it tore Rochelle's life apart. She said, when someone undergoes such a stressful situation for so many years, it makes you susceptible to other things. And she was diagnosed with a chronic pain disorder, which has been nicknamed the suicide disease because of how painful it is. And she had to quit her job. She got she had debilitating PTSD. And so finally, when she sees on the news that his home is being raided, she's like, finally, finally, this is happening. Someone is taking him down. So that's when she calls abc news and says i have something to say Mm -hmm. so investigators needed her to build their case but they because they worried that you know the public opinion would be so on his side that you know they needed people to basically come forward as anti-character witnesses and be like this guy fucking sucks so the assistant district attorney said My conclusion was that Jared Fogle was fully involved in criminal activity with Russell Taylor. My question was, was I going to be able to hold him accountable for the totality of what he did? Mm. So the defense didn't argue that Jared was not a pedophile, but they said he was a good candidate for treatment. And a psychologist testified that Jared became a sex addict when he gave up his old eating habits, like trading one addiction for another. That's not how that works. They also said... Jared was only guilty of mild pedophilia because most of his victims were 16 or 17. Oh, my God. I thought you were going to say something even more fucked up that, well, the others were international or something. Oh, no, no. But but like, I feel like some some sort of bullshit like that is going to be part of the defense or could be part of the defense. But he's like, I mean, he's been sleeping. He's been part of the subway thing for like 15 years. Mm -hmm. I don't know when his first time with a child happened, but it seems like for the last 15 years, he's been causing a lot of fucking problems. Like this isn't a minor issue. Deep seated damage. Yeah. Mild pedophilia is a wild thing to say. One kid, by the way, would be more than too minor pedophilia. Not not mild. Right. Exactly. It's it's like, well, some of them were 16. There's no such thing as mild pedophilia. Some of them weren't. Right. Exactly. It's, It's an insane thing to argue. It's like they had nowhere... They just needed to persu- persuade enough people. But, you know, of course, the the 80 was not buying it. He said, I think you can have a number of addictions and you're not suddenly going to find someone underage sexually attractive. Yes. Mm-hmm. So texts and recordings like the ones Rochelle took also proved Jared was attracted to children as young as six. So they had this on audio. This wasn't going to help his case any. He's y- women- younger, younger than six or as young as six. But also it's just minor pedophilia. But so. it's just my, mild, you know. It's not that big of a deal and everyone's being it's dramatic. It's not a big deal. He's just like you. No, he's not. <laughs> so multiple women like Rochelle came forward and said he had talked openly to them about his attraction to young children. So he's doing this all over the place. Well, he's so willing to do it to a stranger. Right strangers. Bef- right before she interviews him on Least television. shocking thing ever that he's telling other people too. Which also feels like a dominance play, right? Because she's about to have to interview yes. him and like be on, but she, he knows push her. Yeah, he off, knows he's in her head now. Off kilter. Yeah, exactly. So in the recordings Rochelle has of their phone calls, he said things like he would love to put a video camera in an elementary school locker room. Quote at the very least. Oh, I vey. So prosecution said this demonstrated a long-standing and persistent pattern of behaviors, not just one moment of bad judgment. Uh, They said this is about using wealth, status, and secrecy to illegally exploit children. So in the end, he was charged with conspiracy to distribute and receive child pornography and victimizing, quote, prostituted minors. 
The judge sentenced Jared to 15 years and eight months in prison with a minimum of 13 years served. And prosecution had recommended a shorter amount of time. And the judge was like, nah, I want to do longer, which is really rare for a judge to do. Um, But Jared said this was absolutely unfair because the judge had two young daughters and Jared felt the judge was, quote, prejudiced against pedophiles. Uh. Guess what? Hello? Most judges are and all judges yeah, I would should ho- be. Hopes? <laughs> At the very least, I would hope so. It's like, well, so, he doesn't like pedophiles, so I think this is like a bias like case because I he's judging a someone's pedophile. dog, but that guy has a dog, so he can't judge me fairly. It's like, wait, that argument is insane. It doesn't make any fucking sense. Also, he literally said, why is he judging a pedophile? Yeah, he's right. literally <laughs> a judge and he's you're a been pedophile. really hired to do that and that yeah. only. Um, so he was also registered, of course, as a sex offender and had to pay out a million dollars not very much, in my opinion, since that's what he made the first year with Subway, uh, in restitution to 10 of his victims. So each of them got like $100,000. And that was only 10 of his victims. We don't even know how many there are. And we also don't know, you know, how many didn't get paid at all or didn't get any, you know, we don't know. It's just, it's just, you know, really sick. Like he just gave $100,000 to each of the 10 named victims and many more got nothing. Uh, so I'm honestly sec- surprised he didn't do any hush money situations or that he we know probably of, I guess. Tried. This is too late now. Oh, you mean like, uh, I mean, maybe he did, but it's not going to stand up in court. Yeah. No, I know. I just, I, I'm surprised we didn't hear about anything like that. Yeah. I don't know. He probably seemed, felt like he was too Good for untouchable that. for that. So his second wife, Katie McLaughlin, filed for divorce as soon as the trial began and also filed for custody of their children. And when she spoke out publicly, she was absolutely devastated. She said through tears, finding out that your husband and the father of your children is a child predator is devastating. You cannot even begin to imagine. Uh, She actually filed a lawsuit against Subway when it came to light that Several reports had already been made to Subway about Jared and oh, uh, his sexual misconduct, and they did absolutely nothing. So that's cool. Well, he was the cash cow, and that's apparently exactly right. that matters more. Apparently, a Subway franchise owner named Cindy Mills had reported Jared in 08. She had met him at her franchise grand opening, and they had started a sexual relationship. And the requests he had made sexual requests became so strange and uncomfortable that she felt unsafe so she approached the subway ceo and he said jared would just be banned from her franchise and it's fine oh my now god he also told her that jared's new wife katie would quote keep jared grounded oh my god what allegedly there were two more reports made to subway about jared's behavior which were never addressed and the lawsuit was ultimately dismissed Jared's accomplice, Russell, was sentenced to 27 years in prison for his part in this whole nightmare. And, you know, a lot of people think Jared got off easy. Russell's stepdaughter, Hannah, said, now looking back on it, it makes me angry. Jared was completely complicit in taking videos of us when we were in our most vulnerable moments. He was a puppet master and Russell was the puppet. So disturbing. In 2020, the case was reopened to investigate their mother, Angie. And both girls were asked to testify against their mom. Christian (sighs) said, you exposed me. I'm going to expose you. Okay. Okay. I just got full body chills. Wow. Hannah said, I've asked myself many times, why would our mom do this to her children? And Christian said, you just feel so unloved. Someone who is supposed to love you and protect you, supposed to be your mom, is dangerous. Mm. It's just heartbreaking. So in 2021, Angie was convicted by a jury and sentenced to 33 years in prison. And Christian and Hannah, for what it's worth, finally feel like they've been able to, you know, start to move on now that they're adults. And Christian has her own child, a daughter. So in the documentary that aired this past month or two, uh, Jared from Subway Catching a Monster, it's called, Christian said, having a child has changed my life. I've never loved somebody so much. I just want to give my daughter what I didn't have. Mm. Which just makes you want to cry. Heartbreaking. Yeah. Hannah said, our entire lives, we've just been surviving. I didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And now I can finally see that light. I I can finally get a little bit of the taste of freedom and happiness. And it tastes so good. It really does. 
Um, both women are really thankful for Rochelle and uh, the role she played in taking Jared down. Yeah. And, you know, R- Rochelle has said doing the right thing is very important to her, but she regrets how much she has lost as a result of this. Um, her son was also interviewed and he says he and his sister both struggle with anxiety and depression. Their family relationships are severely damaged. One issue um, that she discussed in the docu-series, which I don't know if you remember, is her daughter finding a journal in which Rochelle had documented her conversations with Jared. And so, you know, she told her daughter, like, no, I was just saying all these things because I was Mm. undercover. But, like, it's hard to unsee that as the child. And and some of the conversations were about Rochelle's children. Like, Jared would ask her... To describe her own children to him and and you know she's documenting all this and her daughter finds it like of course that's it has a devastating impact on you and your relationship and you know it's deeply disturbing the last i heard rochelle and her daughter are still estranged um you know i don't know if anything has changed but rochelle's son thomas uh moved to taiwan he never came back to america um but despite that he has said i'm very proud of my mother she did something heroic and it was selfless because she lost a lot in the process and rochelle has spoken out uh in the docuseries as well to jared's victims and when asked if she had any advice she said it would be do not give Jared the power to define what he did to you as who you are, because that's not who you are. And love yourself because you survived. And I personally thank you for coming forward to help stop a monster. Wow. And that's the fucking outrageous story of Jared Fogel, the subway guy. <sighs> that's it, wild. It's dark. It's dark. It's fucked up. Ugh, it's, it's no so one would have known. F- it's up. It's just like hiding in plain sight you know Mm -hmm. and also like hiding right on your television screen like right in front of you well great job christine i'm glad i got i'm sorry i really felt like i kept interrupting you i'm glad you got to add to it because i feel like i i totally fucking forgot about the whole fbi being like you like trapping you gotta be ours now yeah like it's so fucked up Um, well no i'm just i'm i i'm glad i could contribute but for the people who uh don't like me stopping you every five seconds i'm sorry you probably hated this uh, episode but no no i feel like it was probably fun to hear that the back and forth but um i have a i have a lighthearted thing to say like how you had a fun fact at the end of your story okay Um, was subway did it start in a sears catalog what happened uh no but there's a butcher shower in the basement just kidding (laughs) um no but uh on Beach to Sandy, I made my brother play a game where I read reviews of either subway stations or subway restaurants, and he had to guess Ooh. which one was which. <laughs> Wait, did he get? Did he do well? He did. You know what? He did surprisingly well. I remember being like surprised at how well he did. Um, but it was it was a fun game for me to put together because I was reading reviews of like New York subway and being you know subway stations and being like oh yeah this could probably be a subway restaurant i mean both could probably like have rats and weird people exactly you know yeah it's actually like yeah you're, you nailed it um, um there was in college we, the the sandwich place everyone everyone went to it happened to be called the subway station and it threw so many people off because it it's was confusing it was a sub place called subway station exactly and it was next to an actual fucking subway. Oh, well, see, there you go. And so people would be like, oh, let's let's go get subway. And you never knew which one it was. And it'd be like, oh, subway station. And it's, I mean, but it was, they made the same sandwich. It <laughs> it's was really so, a rude thing to do, in I my think opinion. They, in my mind, it was like before subway was a chain and they were like, we're going to dig our heels in and we're committing because we've been here longer. And they just, and then subway built a fucking subway next to them just to piss them off. I just don't know. to be like, let's settle this once and for all yeah um, okay christine let's end on this for the for the episode go to subway order i want to say the tuna sandwich but i feel like i can't say that anymore you um, can say here, it here's the thing i don't eat meat really i don't at least i try not to so you know do you like a veggie delight I, I do a veggie delight but i put on mayo and cheese and i get a foot long and i don't log any of the calories <laughs> sometimes i get the is it the spicy 
BMT, spicy Italian. It's got like salami and pepperoni and all that on oh, it. So yeah. the, ex- the exact opposite of what you do. <laughs> um, yeah, with, like, you go straight cheese, to the butcher shower. I know. Spicy um, mustard, all that good stuff. Yikes. Yeah, I love a spicy mustard. That's probably the only thing that we have the same on our sandwiches. It, un- unless we order shamefully order tuna, um, which has happened despite your flawed memory. <laughs> I think give it a couple more months and after like a full year, I'll be like, oh, I could really try that tuna again, you know? Yeah, maybe when we're on tour next, I'll be like, what do you think? <laughs> I will tell you, they got a mean chocolate chip cookie, so... Uh, <laughs> they do I'll, have a good cookie. I'll at least see you at the cookie counter, the exact opposite of their health campaign. Yeah, so. we'll be wearing mustaches since I don't really want to support them <laughs> after all this. Yeah, but I'll, I will eat the cookie. I will. All right, well... I'll, I guess um, if you want more, you can go over on Patreon and join us for an after chat to see us probably giggle about sandwiches. I don't know. Yeah, and what else? Until then, I guess I see you next week. And, do you want me to start it? Oh, I thought you were going to say, yeah, I'll see you next week. I'm excited. Oh, okay. Y- yes. See you then. Well, because <laughs> no, you and I are actually going to see each other next week because of Florida, right? Oh, yes, yes. I will see you next week, yes. <laughs> I'm excited for it. God oh, damn okay. it, Christine. Well, it's not next week because you're supposed to be traveling. So, But yes, oh. in a couple weeks, yes, we, I will see I you. Don't know. I don't know days anymore. I'm excited to see you and maybe your baby if I'm all healed. So I don't think so because I feel like last time, like we said, she's really done a number on you. So I don't want you to... We'll have to restart the uh, the relationship. It's, it's only been like a year, so we can... Square we can... one. Okay. We can come back quick. So, all uh, right. And that's why we.